the European energy transition a year, a year ahead of the 20s. Many thanks for being here so numerous. This is a common event of Bruegel think tank, of Jacques Delors Institute, and the Jacques Delors Energy Center, and of course, of the Florence School of Regulation. And the event uh, is there to launch a book that you see here. 550 pages, we try to compete with World Energy Outlook and the Clean Energy Package. Uh, it is also there to launch an online training developed on the basis of this book together with Florence School of Regulation and N2E. And of course, it's there to discuss what's going on on uh, the European energy transition in this year, 2019. And uh, so I uh, took the fun to look a bit at the numbers. When you look at the numbers you find 190219 19. in this year we are 11271 days ahead of 2050 and of course we all look at cop 21 the implementation of uh, the uh, climate agenda in the light of the dramatic climate events everyone witnesses and that make it to the eurobarometer people are worried about the state of the world's climate. We are 39 days ahead of Brexit, so I'm very happy that we have Philip Lowe, who is going to give us some insights where we are, <laughs> poor Philip, uh, on Brexit. And we are 266 days ahead of COP25, that is the decisive COP, to get the Paris Agreement up and running after the successful rulebook was adopted in COP24 in Katowice. We are 92 days ahead of the European Parliament election. There's still some trouble for the MEPs from the UK. Should they run? Should they stay in Brussels? Should they continue to rent some flats? All this is unclear. And we are 315 days ahead of the next decade that is framed by uh, the Clean Energy Package for all Europeans. Um, so I would like to briefly mention the book that took us one year in a collaborative exercise and that is in a way a flavor of the energy transition it is not the yellow pages of the energy transition because there's lots of absent parties too but it gives you a flavor it is a colorful picture of what this energy transition is all about uh, and it is of course our thoughts as individuals there's man, many people from commission, from institutions that have contributed on their personal behalf, how they see the future. I give you uh, the list of those who have contributed to this book, 42 authors, nearly as many as n as members, very proud. Jacques Delors, I'm very proud that he has accepted to write the foreword for this book, Sami Andorra, Antonella Battaglini, Klausita Borchardt, Christian Buchel, Dirk Buschler, uh, Claire Camus, Alicia Carrasco, uh, Andrzej Sheglash, Olivier Coradi, Marina Avicenne, Jostel Beck, Gustav Fredriksson, Christophe Jean Scrue, Dolph Gielen, uh, Jean-Michel Glachon, uh, Simon Hackspiel, Tom Haus, Louis Janeiro, Pascal Lamy, who you see in a minute, who's known for getting up late, uh, early in the morning, Maria Eugenia Leos, uh, because he's in Washington, uh, Martin Casallo, uh, Philip Lowe, uh, Leonardo Meus, Philip Offenburg, Jean-Baptiste Paquel, Diego Pavia, Thomas pellerin carlin Alberto Potoschnik, Konrad Buchala, Laurent Schmidt, Helmut Schmidt von Ludo, Teresa Schneider, Christian Schulke, Jesse Scott, Pierre Serkin, Connie Stachus, Frau Ketis, Sonja Duig, Peter Wiss, and Kirsten Westphal, and Jörg Zachmann. So I'm very proud that all these people took time in uh, addition to their job to uh, write their chapters, and we have six, uh, six main topics. The first section of, of this book is about uh, the, the context of the energy transition. It's typically called the trilemma, theory of supply, uh, sustainability, and competitiveness. But we try to show that those three angles of what was invented in 2006 by uh, the commission uh, is not uh, mutually exclusive, but hangs together. The externalities, uh, sustainability, have to be put, of course, into 
the economic equation. And without uh, security of supply, competitiveness cannot be achieved. We are looking into institutions, and we look into institutions beyond only uh, the three uh, well-known European institutions. We also look into what's going on on the side of the covenant of mayors, all these new and colorful, uh, colorful constituencies that shape the European energy transition. Competitiveness and affordability, the social dimension. Pascal Lamy is going to elaborate on this in a minute uh, in his video speech. Affordability, energy poverty observatory, having everyone on board and not only the smart digital geeks that love to play around. Um, security of supply and risk preparedness are another big chapter of this book, gas and electricity at once, cybersecurity, not to be forgotten. Innovation, new ecosystems. We give the space and the place for all these new actors and players in the energy transition. And we finish with facts, with maps, and with scenarios because we do not believe in a post-fact world. Uh, and based on this, as I said already, you will see uh, this Flow School of Regulation and NSOE uh, online training emerge. This is largely devoted to international constituencies, to uh, those who want to learn what Europe is doing and what they could use in their own place. And let me conclude with quoting Jacques Delors, uh, who we can't pay enough tribute to for all his achievements in the European integration pathway. In his uh, foreword, he was saying the following, <clears throat> Europe's strengths in the energy transition lies in the drive of millions of citizens, consumers, local elected representatives, researchers, innovators, entrepreneurs, and workers who make this energy transition a reality. And this shows again, it is a very democratic exercise where people take ownership of what is one of the most important dimensions of Europe today. So many thanks for your attention. And we are now, I want to talk you through the agenda, the menu of today's event. Uh, we are starting with a video speech of Pascal Lamy, who is also author of the book. Uh, unfortunately, not with us today, as he is in uh, the United States, but joins us via video conference uh, and has a keynote on the social and innovation dimension for the energy union of the 20s. And then uh, we have a first round table that looks at institutions with Klaus Dieter, uh, Dirk Buschle, Philipp Lowe, Alberto. Another round table looking into decarbonization uh, and the need for net zero emissions. And after lunch, we have a round table concluding, us, concluding this event with the new faces of energy, new players, new topics, sector and the sector coupling. So uh, many thanks for being here. And uh, I think we can now have uh, Pascal Lamy join. I understand I'm now connected, Susan. Is it all right on your side? Pascal, good morning. Here's a full uh, place waiting for you. And many thanks for getting up so early and delivering a keynote speech to us on the social and innovation dimension of the energy transition. Now it's the case. Is it okay now? So, uh, thanks for the introduction, Suzanne. Uh, I heard uh, your impressive list of names that uh, contributed to this book, and I was very happy to recognize many, many friends, mostly among the elders, but that's a very impressive crowd. And let me also thank uh, Bruegel uh, for organizing this event and my uh, friends at the Institut Jacques Delors, uh, uh, Geneviève Pons, who heads the uh, Jacques Delors Institute in Brussels and uh, Thomas Pernacarlin 
who heads the Energy Center at the uh, Institute uh, Jacques Delors. A few words uh, on the topic of today, uh, which I believe and I think we uh, most of us would agree with that, uh, is one of the major policy challenges of uh, the next years. And I'm saying this uh, on the eve of uh, important uh, European elections, uh, which will uh, elect a new European Parliament, and of course, following that, a new European Commission. Uh, but I think this issue of the energy transition is one of the major things uh, for the time to come. Because, of course, uh, we know uh, where we are and where we are not on climate change. And as we all know, we are rather on the not uh, than on the other side. Because, of course, of the major importance of energy uh, in this uh, climate uh, action, uh, if we want uh, to uh, target the uh, zero emission uh, 2050 uh, deadline, uh, which, as we know, is not yet formally an EU uh, deadline, but I hope uh, we will uh, get there after a few more discussions with the Council and the Parliament. And of course, uh, because as I've often said, uh, this is a major issue uh, for uh, the European Union in the world. I often said that for many people on this planet, uh, the European flag is not uh, blue with uh, uh, yellow stars, it's green. We are seen by the rest of the world as having the capacity to influence the trajectory of humanity to a more climate uh, friendly world. And this is a responsibility which uh, I think we have to be uh, aware of. The way forward has, I think, reasonably been identified in uh, two major uh, directions for Europe. One is energy efficiency and uh, the second one is renewables. I put this in this order. One, energy efficiency. Second, uh, growth of renewables. Although I know uh, that uh, others might put these two uh, issues uh, in uh, not the same order. For, by the way, for those who are uh, interested in renewables, uh, please have a look at the piece which the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency has just published in January on the geopolitics of moving to renewables. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting, new, fresh uh, uh, insight into a major dimension uh, of, of the growth of renewables. If we are right that energy efficiency and renewables are uh, the way to go, uh, I think it's fair to say that we will, in Europe, have to go uh, with two uh, major challenges. One is uh, the social acceptability, uh, and the second one is uh, the uh, innovation capacity. And both of them need to be seriously addressed if we want to move from uh, Sunday uh, speeches uh, to Monday action. On the social aspect, uh, I'm not saying this uh, because I'm French, and we've had a, a bit of that uh, for a uh, few uh, recent months uh, with the Gilets Jaunes. Uh, uh, a number of us, and a number of you, by the way, had already uh, spotted this issue, the energy transition will have a social cost, which needs to be addressed and mitigated. True, not much attention uh, has been put to that uh, before a few uh, crises, uh, which, as usual, when social tensions rise, translate uh, into politics. Uh, we had a Belgian crisis. Uh, we had this Gilets Jaunes uh, in France, which are not all about the energy transition, but also about that. We also, of course, have had uh, these uh, very severe and heavy pressures uh, on uh, Germany and on Poland uh, about uh, coal. I don't need to insist it. What should we do? Uh, what Jacques Delors, uh, who, as you said, uh, agreed 
uh, uh, to write uh, the preface uh, to the book, which I must say has become a very rare occurrence. Uh, and uh, the people at the Institute de Delors had to convince him, uh, but it worked. Uh, and I think uh, what uh, he proposes, which is a social uh, pact for energy transition, uh, makes a lot of sense. And by the way, uh, is quite nicely in line uh, with the view uh, de Delors had of how uh, to combine uh, sort of Ricardian. Uh, efforts, Schumpeterian efforts, and, and some sort of consensus by uh, social partners accompanied uh, with structural policies. Uh, so if you look at the way he advocated the way internal market should be done by United, uh, you probably will find a, a lot of similitude in what he believes that now uh, is uh, the energy uh, transition uh, challenge. There are a few tools to do that. We can think of adjusting this globalization fund to make it more into an adjustment fund that would provide uh, resources to accompany uh, this uh, social uh, transition. Uh, we have with Erasmus Plus uh, uh, a, a tool that could be geared to uh, training uh, more young people into technologies uh, that uh, will necessit be necessitated by energy transition uh, and uh, we also have uh, other uh, systems which probably at EU level including in the social fund uh, could be geared uh, to addressing a problem of energy poverty uh, which does exist and which of course if the energy transition implies higher prices in order to internalize uh, carbon prices and this is not the only way to go, I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, but this could help uh, at least creating a visible EU in addressing uh, energy poverty so that we do not fall into this uh, political uh, imbalance that EU is advocating for something that has a social cost and then addressing this is left uh, with the member states, thus increasing this sort of democratic deficit, which is already a problem in our union. So that's for the first part. Second one is, of course, innovation. And uh, this is uh, a piece uh, which we wrote with uh, Thomas Pedrincarna uh, in, in the book. Uh, I did this notably uh, because of the work I did for the European Commission, uh, this uh, Lab Fab App report, uh, which uh, was meant uh, to frame the next uh, European uh, Research and Innovation Programme, uh, and uh, which I must say uh, worked uh, reasonably well. Uh, I contributed to many of these commissions, reports, whether sharing them, whether participating in them. Uh, of course, I know that uh, there is a huge cemetery uh, for very good ideas and very good reports. This time, I think, uh, the Commission, uh, the Parliament and the Council uh, took this uh, issue seriously as evidenced by what the Commission has uh, tabled in the next uh, multi-financial framework, uh, which is a huge jump in resourcing both research and innovation. Now, the topic of today and of our piece uh, is not about research, it's about innovation. Why not about research? Because we don't think we have a big problem with research. We produce in the European Union roughly 26, 27% of the new knowledge this uh, world creates every year, which for 7% of the population is a reasonable ratio. The problem we have, and we've known that for a long time, is that translating this into innovation, i.e. into uh, products and services uh, that get into market and contribute to changing infrastructures, habit, consumption systems, even cultures, that's the big problem. And as we've often said, in the European Union, uh, we are quite good uh, at uh, making uh, science with money. Uh, we're not good at making money with science, which is, I recognize, a bit of a mercantilist way of expressing this problem, but that's the issue. And there are, of course, including in the uh, energy sector, Many solutions to that. I'm not going to wait into 
how complex this issue is. It is complex. It's about finance, it's about culture, it's about the internal market, it's about industrial policy, it's about competition policy. Many facets need uh, to be considered in order to move forward. Let me just say that here again, there are two engines which we need to work on. The first one is resources. There are many reasons to provide public resources for innovation, not least to address a number of risks which markets might not address properly, uh, risk in, uh, in technology, risk in the market, and we develop this uh, with uh, Thomas uh, in our piece. Uh, we know that, but there is also another one uh, which uh, we uh, also strongly advocate, which is uh, uh, regulation. So it's not just about funding, it's also about creating a legal uh, juridical framework that constrains actors to change what needs to be changed in production and consumption systems. Uh, I am a big believer in that, not for a sort of old-fashioned statism, but because the experience shows that when the regulator targets a level of, for instance, carbon emissions, which uh, seems to be uh, uh, extremely ambitious uh, to main actors, then if the legislator or the regulator has the courage to do that, science, innovation, market will adjust. And we have a very good example of that uh, in the area of waste, for instance, uh, where uh, the progress that has been made in many countries in treatment, collection, treatment of waste in a more eco-friendly uh, fashion uh, have been created by regulation. I think this is the way to go for Europe in a number of years, provided, of course, this regulation is done at EU level. I'm not talking, of course, uh, regulations like emissions uh, by, uh, by uh, engines. And I'm glad, for instance, that uh, I heard that yesterday uh, there was an agreement at EU level uh, on the trucks emissions, which I think is uh, something which was missing uh, in the two notes. So a mix of general considerations, but also attention to the toolbox. Uh, I think this is what uh, we've tried to do uh, and you've tried to do with this book. Uh, and I hope again uh, that uh, the next uh, political generation, the one uh, starting after uh, the uh, May elections, the new commission will take this as a basis, the food for thought is there. What we now need is to put pressure uh, for action. And this is what electoral campaign should be about. And so let's make of this a theme, whatever uh, our political belongings are, uh, in order to try to move forward. I think there is something on the table that now allows politicians to say, we know what to do, let's do it. Thanks for your attention. And of course, you have been leading on the Horizon Europe uh, group discussion. Uh, Mission Innovation wants to double the research sp spending, or is, is a commitment to double research uh, spending in Europe by 2021. Yeah? Are we on track, according to you? in Europe? You're right. This is uh, the target uh, which uh, the science people, which I had the privilege to chair, not being myself uh, coming from science. This was the target which we, uh, we summed up our report, which is a bit less simple than that, but you always need uh, something which uh, captures attention. Uh, we are not there yet totally, as uh, the discussion on this part of the uh, financial framework is still going on, both with the Council and with the Parliament. But I'm reasonably confident that there will be a, a big jump forward, maybe not doubling, uh, uh, but I think there will be a big jump forward. And of course, what matters most is that a large part of the increase in resources 
will go to the innovation part of the research and innovation program. We all know research and innovation are two different things, two different sorts of people, two different sorts of culture, two different distance to markets, but there has to be a way to foster innovation resource-wise, leaving aside uh, what I mentioned about uh, regulation, there must be a way forward to replicate, if not imitate, the success uh, which the European Union uh, got with the European Research Council, which is why uh, Commissioner Modas, uh, who has been uh, working, I think, extremely efficiently on this topic, this is why he suggested this uh, European Innovation Council, not again that it should be same thing, the same process, these are two different universes, but I think uh, there's a lot to be done in this direction, and I think this is now recognized, and the fundamental reason for that is we know where the US are going, we know where China is going, we know where Korea is going, we know where Japan is going, they have their plan, and if you look at China, for instance, uh, whether it's uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, devices uh, or whether it's now uh, batteries uh, for cars, uh, we know that uh, there is a cost in not moving forward, so we need to catch up. Thank you very much. We can allow for two questions if someone wants to comment or have a question for uh, Pascal Lamy, uh, who joined us early in the morning from the US now. Now or never. Any questions? This does not seem to be the case, so many, many thanks, Pascal, for this, and uh, thanks for joining us so early uh, this morning. Congratulations again for your successful chairing of this Horizon Europe Group, and thanks for contributing to the book. My pleasure, and have a, have a good day of work, and uh, again, uh, congratulations for this uh, book. Bye-bye. We also have uh, Thomas uh, Pellerin uh, Carlin here, who is also working for the uh, Jacques Delors Energy Center. Uh, and needs to be mentioned here that Jacques Delors Institute is building uh, a more uh, important capacity on energy, uh, and uh, that we are very happy about this cooperation, not only for today's event, but also for, uh, for the book. So uh, now the, the next panel, or the first panel, is about institutions. This is the is one of the, the sections of our book, and I'm very happy to have a panel with uh, the following uh, contributors and keynote speakers, and would like them to already join me here. Uh, Philip Lowe, who needs, he has the worst task today, most probably uh, explaining or not explaining the next steps on, on Brexit. Thank you, Philip, uh, for joining us. You are the uh, former Director General of uh, DG Energy. Uh, I'm very happy to have Klaus-Dieter Borchardt. Klaus-Dieter Borchardt is the Deputy Director General of DG Energy today and one of the architects of the Clean Energy Package for all Europeans. Dirk Buschler, the Deputy uh, Director of the Energy Community, one of the institutions that we are going to discuss. And finally, Alberto Potocnik. Is there? Alberto is the director of the agency, as it's called, yeah, the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators. So in the next hour, we are going to talk about institutions from various angles. And let me start to introduce uh, what I also try to describe in my introductory uh, chapter in the book, what we have in mind when we talk about institutions. So first of all, of course, everyone would think uh, about the three trilogue parties, co commission, the council, and the parliament. Yes, these are the three decisive institutions and that have changed over the course of the European integration project. For example, everyone knows the parliament with the direct election 79 became more important. The commission became more important with each step it took from the customs union from the the, the, the the free trade area to the customs union and then to the single market that Jacques Delors 
has uh, conceived. Uh, of course, the institution building has been shaped by the steps of integration of uh, the European um, project in energy. It is uh, the European community for coal and steel that is always mentioned as the starting point and that made it with Euratom to uh, the treaties of Rome as a starting point. But maybe when we think about it, it's maybe not so much about energy at that time. It's more about strategic resources that had to be put together as to avoid to have any more war in Europe that went out of the second disastrous uh, world war. And it's important to underline that then energy policy or energy in all the periods, 60s and 70s and 80s also was very largely national, it was part of the economic policy it was monopoly organized. It was something that people were alienated from big blocks over capacities, uh, not European uh, national uh, premise in many senses. And this changed only with this last phase of uh, the European project, this single market project, believing that to the best of the European citizens, more integration, more uh, uh, a single market would add welfare to everyone. Three packages of liberalization plus a change in agenda with sustainability externalities put into the equation and currently the climate agenda have put energy on the European level. And it's very clear that of course the energy cannot be national anymore if you talk about climate, if you talk about sustainability, but also if you talk about the market because my organization, NSUE, is all about cross-border. Transmission system operators do not look, of course, at the borders at first hand. I say all this to, to underline that the institution building uh, went in, in, in parallel, of course, to this change of agenda. So uh, it means uh, the three institutions, it means in the sense of subsidiarity, the national was always there, is there, is important, the local and the regional is important in the sense of, of subsidiarity. It also means in the sense of the democratization of energy in Europe, decentralization, self-generation, the interest of people who are fed up to get uh, arrogant answers by engineers, especially in my home country, Germany, there was a clear no to these big blocks ruling the energy world. Uh, these people have set up their own structures, the covenant of mayors, Renewables Grid Initiative, NGOs, they all build capacity. Beuk has 10 people today in Brussels working on energy. So these are also institutions that form part of this energy ecosystem uh, and that the three incumbent institutions have to work with. That's why stakeholder forum have been put in place, Florence Forum, Madrid Forum, Infrastructure Forum, uh, and all these multiple consultations and exchanges that make sure people are on board. What is more, the third package has created new institutions that I'm happy to see Alberto here, uh, the ASA, Agency for Cooperation of Energy Regulators, but also the TSO organization, NSOC, NSOE, and now the clean package adds the DSOs, EU DSO, as a new structure that has to ensure that the national is represented through a European structure and plays its part of the, uh, of the, of the piece. Um, to uh, mention, of course, also the beyond Europe dimension. We see Dirk sitting here, energy community. Europe's neighbors are eager to join. Uh, there was a saying from an American diplomat saying, Europe has no neighbors, it only has future members. Uh, in that sense, the energy community is there to ensure the uh, alignment, the implementation of the acquis communautaire in uh, especially uh, parts of former Yugoslavia, but well beyond. Ukra Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and those countries are playing uh, a role in your organization here. And maybe to uh, have a, and I stop here, to, to have a, uh, a view to the, the future, what we see uh, arising now is that the international organizations, UNF, C, the agenda, sustainable development goals, that those are linking up in a very smart way, OECD, G20, 
uh, with uh, the European agenda, and that there is a common push, of course, driven by the climate agenda, but maybe also by what uh, is called by Klaus Schwab, the fourth industrial revolution, this uh, move, digitalization, new technologies that see the transport, digital, power, gas, things coupled, and that might change the very sense of energy in the future. So I invite you to discover a flavor of these institutions and this change that we are in the midst of through uh, the contributions of my distinguished panelists. And of course, uh, it, it wouldn't be complete if we wouldn't look at one of the paramount events uh, that is potentially on the horizon for 29 of March, Brexit, the unfortunate leave of the UK, and Philip Lowe is going to introduce us, us to what exactly that means on the energy field and what we can expect. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure that uh, it's, it's really appropriate after your stratospheric introduction to narrow down the, dis the, the discussion, debate to what is going to happen in the UK. I, I would like to start, first of all, by saying that um, one can see the energy transition at a global level because the externalities of climate change are global. Uh, you can see the industrial revolution there as well in, digital, in the digital economy, in the decentralization which is going on everywhere, um, uh, moving from rather centralized energy systems to decentralized ones in certain cases. Um, at the same time, as you also emphasized, um, a lot of what uh, uh, constitutes the energy transition has to be decided and owned by local communities, regional communities, whatever. And that means addressing issues about energy efficiency. Pasco mentioned those um, energy efficiency measures, the regulations which encourage and uh, foresee uh, energy savings. It also means uh, thinking about urban planning and mobility, uh, which is a much wider subject than simply the word energy. It's, it's sustainable, um, uh, planning for a sustainable future. So both at a global level and at a local level, this energy transition is quite comprehensive. Uh, at the same time, um, the European Union, and I think... Uh, the UK as part of that European Union, have uh, always been agreed on three fundamental objectives in the energy sector. Not just a sustainable future, but also open and competitive markets and secure and affordable energy for consumers. And um, it is uh, to a certain extent ironic that at the time when uh, Dieter Borchardt and others have making substantial progress towards the idea of a competitive uh, single market with uh, a very high level of interconnection uh, on, in continental Europe. I exclude the Iberian Peninsula, I exclude the UK. It's ironic that having uh, made its major contribution intellectually to liberalizing the market, the UK now is withdrawing from it, uh, withdrawing from the potential which would come from it. And that potential is, it is there in the sense uh, that if you are moving to a world which, is, which uh, contains more electricity and more renewables, <laughs> then you're going to deal with a number of sy system challenges which can only be helped by the potential for wider cooperation uh, on a geographical basis. Energy, except in China, energy doesn't travel over thousands of kilometers. <laughs> it does in China because they can just do it. Um, but um, 
uh, what uh, is there as a potential for Europe is to to develop um, uh, systems and develop a regulatory framework which allows for that cooperation, allows people to grasp the opportunities to innovate and to create things. Uh, I was asked yesterday in the um, uh, video um, uh, interviews, um, uh, could we not uh, build on the Northern Seas Initiative uh, for sharing wind power resources? Um, that, by the way, was an intergovernmental initiative, <laughs> which from the beginning required something which the European Union as such, and you mentioned the institutions, uh, aims to provide, which is common rules. <laughs> because the misconception in the UK debate that, for example, even the energy union is about centralizing <laughs> is simply that if you want to liberate a market across borders, you have to have common rules. And, of course, you can have people in charge of common agencies or common institutions which can exaggerate their role and look as if they're centralizing, but the whole purpose of the common agencies and, and regulations of the European Union was not to centralize, but to widen the scope for markets to work effectively. And now I come to Brexit. <laughs> because if you, if you want uh, to do things with your neighbors, uh, you can uh, share an objective and you can share institutions. If you don't want to sacrifice your sovereignty, then you, you do it on your own. In the history of Ireland, um, which some of you know very well, uh, the, the nationalist uh, uh, people uh, on, on the side of uh, a nationalist uh, or independent island, Sinn Féin, the word Sinn Féin mean on your own. <laughs> Let's do it on your own. Now, the UK, having shared the objectives of, of the energy transition with the uh, EU, is, is not... In the, it's not going to put energy in the front line of the problems which it may, or the challenges which it has post Brexit. They are there's plenty of potential for doing things at a national level on energy efficiency, on development of infrastructures, on development of renewables. There is absolutely no reason why that will not go on. But the 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 lost opportunity there is that potential to share this objective more widely. Um, uh, according to the withdrawal agreement, um, we are, as far as the energy is concerned, not talking about even a common emissions trading scheme. We're not talking about sharing uh, the agencies of, 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 um, of Europe um, because ideologically in the approach to Brexit, both from the government and from those who wanted uh, Brexit, um, the idea of um, participating in an agency is precisely against this, this objective of doing things on your own. Now, I think that in the longer term, uh, the pragmatic arguments for doing things together, including in particular interconnection, will be high on the agenda in the UK and in continental Europe, whether it's with countries of the EU, countries of EEA, or more widely. So I think in the longer term, we are going to find that there will be uh, some degree of gradual progression towards more cooperation from, in any case, a very low base in terms of interconnection. Um, as far as the next few months uh, are concerned, uh, I have to say that if I knew what was going to happen, I'd, uh, 
already be a fairly rich man. I'm sure George Soros seemed to know what happened um, <laughs> over the, the, the European monetary system 20 you know, however long ago it was. Um, I'd just give you one or two thoughts. If, if you read the draft withdrawal agreement which Mrs. May has presented and agreed in principle with the European Union, if you read it, it's very difficult to argue with 99% of it because it's a treaty which is the reverse of joining the European Union. <laughs> you're coming out. <laughs> And if you're coming out and you don't want anything to do with the Commission, the Parliament, the Council, the agencies, etc., um, then you you have to uh, acknowledge that the law, the law, uh, international law of that withdrawal treaty, uh, will give you that independence. And then you have to go on f from that to say, well, can we do this without some? transitional arrangements, and there the withdrawal agreement also contains those, the, with those uh, transitional arrangements. Um, and then the issue is, well, uh, can, what, what is the future relationship with the UK, between the UK and the EU, which is the major point on which those who uh, uh, voted against the, the draft agreement <laughs> and the political declaration which accompanied it. And um, I think um, all of us who have taken part in trade um, negotiations in the past, and you remember before Pascal uh, took over as Commissioner for Trade, they were these uh, negotiations were carried out geographically by different parts of the Commission. I happened to negotiate the South Africa Trade Agreement and the Cotonou Agreement. And in both those agreements, um, uh, you've got to pay a lot of attention not just to tariffs, but to regulation, to, to institutional arrangements, and it takes some time to do it. Um, that, combined with the, um, the issue as to whether there will be a, a seamless border in Ireland, are, are the, these two reasons are the reason, this misconception that they can, that you can have a new agreement quickly, and the se secondly, the illusion that one can leave the customs union, leave the, leave the single market, leave the institutions and not have a border <laughs> in Ireland. These, these two fundamental issues have not really been explained, perhaps badly explained from a European point of view also, but those are the ones which are holding up an agreement. And the final thing I want to say about Brexit is, of course, if you have a government which is um, uh, very much under pressure to achieve a majority for it, uh, this agreement or something like it, then if you want to um, obtain some adjustments, either through the political declaration, or probably alone the political declaration, or you make it into a protocol, or you want to fine-tune the withdrawal agreement, then uh, uh, at what stage do you do it tactically? <laughs> uh, if, you, if you were to do it um, too quickly, then it's quite clear that the, those who are extreme in their views, radical in their views about Brexit, will want more concessions before you finally vote. So, as you are well accustomed to that in Germany, fünf Minuten vor zwölf is the right time to, for a final agreement, which will allow you then the time to have a vote in Parliament, in the European Parliament, and finally a vote in the House of Commons. But not before then, Otherwise, you are down on a slippery slope of not knowing what's going on. Now, is that, is that process controllable? Answer, <laughs> very difficult to control. And if, if uh, Mrs. May um, succeeds, uh, or her colleagues succeed in doing that, uh, perhaps she has um, more talent than we think she has. Sorry. <laughs>
Many thanks, uh, Philippe. And it reminds me of these James Bonds where in the very last uh, moment before the blast you find the solution. And maybe you will be a rich man because your speculation that maybe everything is going to be decided on 28th of March. Uh, uh, I think everyone here will, will follow this uh, with a lot of attention. And of course, there will be the opportunity to, to ask also questions uh, to you uh, once all the panelists have presented their, their views. Uh, Klaus Dieter, uh, part of your job on the clean energy package was also to conceive this regional approach that is uh, paid a tribute to in, in this new package. Yeah? What is this all about? Is it really new? Uh, what do you want to achieve with that? How would we see regional institutions develop over the course of the next decade? Thank you very much, Susanna. And uh, it's a bit funny that we were starting off here with Philip Lowe talking about disruption of regional uh, cooperation and common rules, as he rightly said. Um, let me pull this to the other corner and telling you why regional cooperation as we practicing it in the European Union is of um, utmost importance and uh, is also delivering uh, very much uh, on our common objective and that is um, uh, to create and develop an internal energy market in Europe. Um, here I... I uh, would like to start by uh, making a, a clear distinction between two different forms of uh, regional cooperation. It's a regional cooperation as it has started as a voluntary bottom-up approach where institutions have found themselves together and have decided because there are a lot of uh, benefits and gains in regional cooperation together, uh, defining their common objectives and then working towards them commonly. This is uh, still um, an approach that you can also find today in our energy system. But it has, uh, uh, from the EU institution, developed further into what we call regionalization. This is a top-down approach where uh, from uh, the legislative level or uh, the lower level uh, Susanna has explained it, uh, the, the, the two different layers already, the legislative one and then, of course, um, the um, other institutions, um, the ENSOs, uh, ACER, the national regulatory authorities. Um, they are setting uh, uh, the common goals, but by um, implementing those, uh, we are using uh, then the cooperation at, at regional level. And this process we call then, uh, when it's set from the top to the bottom, regionalization. And this regionalization has been um, very strongly improved, uh, in the system operation. It has uh, uh, led to convergence of the market. Uh, and in general, it has uh, facilitated uh, the achieving um, the completion of the internal energy market. And therefore, uh, this concept has also been used very much so uh, in our clean energy for all European package. And you find uh, these two forms, the regional cooperation and regionalization, in uh, quite a number, if not uh, almost all, of the legal acts uh, that uh, are part of this uh, package. It starts uh, with a governance regulation uh, where we have set uh, clear rules for regional cooperation between member states, so at the member states level. It was uh, broken down uh, through the uh, climate and energy uh, plans that all member states have to draw up, and not only looking into their own fields, but even uh, uh, beyond. And then on the uh, Renewables Directive, the reform of the Renewables Directive, here you can see also uh, the aspect of regional cooperation in terms of strengthening um, of um, the convergence of the support schemes for renewables uh, with an element of cross-border participation. That is also, again, something where you uh, build up uh, something at regional level. Um, you have, uh, furthermore, the risk preparedness regulation uh, in electricity uh, where you have the cooperation of member states, uh, cooperation that can even uh, lead to mutual assistance 
in uh, times of uh, crisis. And then, of course, uh, uh, the most prominent uh, acts in which you find back the regional cooperation uh, are the electricity regulation and also uh, the ACER uh, regulation. If you uh, look uh, from the third energy package uh, onwards towards um, the clean energy uh, package, you can see here uh, clearly um, the drive from the regional cooperation to regionalization. In the uh, clean energy package, we already had uh, what was called the regional security centers. It was uh, based on a voluntary bottom-up uh, cooperation system. And now we have moved uh, uh, in our latest uh, reform um, by regionalization to regional coordination centers, which uh, have um, old tasks that they are taking over from the uh, regional security centers, uh, stemming mainly from uh, the network codes and guidelines. But you also have a new task for these uh, regional coordination centers. And uh, here I can mention uh, the balancing, I can mention um, the uh, solidarity in crisis, risk preparedness, transparency, common planning uh, at the regional level. All these issues are now there. And uh, these regional coordination centers uh, themselves, they are uh, also empowered uh, to act. And uh, most of you who have followed at least the political discussions around uh, the regional cooperation part of our clean energy package uh, will remember that this was at the heart of the political discussions and it was highly disputed uh, to what extent uh, can we empower these regional coordination centers to take decisions. And the political compromise that uh, came out of all this was that uh, these centers are now uh, empowered to take what it's a new uh, category of uh, soft law, I would say, coordinated actions. And of course, they can issue recommendations to TSOs. This is not a, a complete, full decisional power of these regional uh, centers, uh, but it can go quite far uh, because the TSOs, even if it is a recommendation, they are slightly bound uh, to this re recommendation and they have to implement it because uh, in the text it's also said that the discretion of TSOs to deviate or derogate from the coordinated actions or recommendations are only allowed with regard to the uh, system uh, security. Uh, and uh, this together still, although we have not conferred um, direct decisional powers to the um, regional security uh, coordination centers, we have a clear uh, decision-making process at the regional level that will help us now when we are implementing uh, the, um, the rules of the, the energy package. Uh, and it will, of course, and that's why we have done it, uh, increase the efficiency of the system operation. It will facilitate the integration of renewables, all these issues that we wanted to achieve. Here you can see the objective setting and giving also at regional level the tools in order to uh, make this happen. Now, uh, this is on uh, the regional uh, security center. I'm sure Alberto will talk about more on ACER and the national regulatory authorities. Therefore, from my side, only that, that of course, also at that level, uh, the clean energy uh, package enhances now also uh, the powers of NRAs and also at ACER level. The NRAs remain, of course, the primary uh, level in order to supervise and uh, also uh, to implement and to monitor. Um, and uh, here, uh, I think, um, when we 
discussed also in the ACER uh, regulation. From somewhere uh, was brought the idea, uh, the Commission is uh, looking at uh, a single uh, European regulator and uh, doing away with uh, the national regulatory authorities. This is, of course, uh, and it was never true, because uh, we need the national regulatory authorities because they are the closest to their markets, to their uh, circumstances, situations. They are the closest to the market players uh, around. So therefore, uh, it we would be foolish uh, to do away with them. But having said that, uh, we need uh, still also regional cooperation between uh, uh, national uh, regulatory authorities because everything has to follow. If you go uh, through regional circles, and circles I mean then also not scattering uh, the internal energy market into different regional zones, but trying in the long run also uh, to um, merge then the, the, uh, the regions and go to, to uh, bigger regions. This is the only way to achieve ultimately uh, the internal fully integrated uh, energy market. The situations around Europe in 28 member states today uh, are too different as if we can, we can do common rules, as uh, Philip said, for the whole EU. But when it comes to the uh, implementation and to the application, we have to go through a regional concept in order ultimately to get to the full one. And here the national regulatory authorities play um, a decisive role, and we have enhanced that. And for ACER, I must say, um, I was really astonished uh, how much discussions uh, have been around uh, that regulation, because when we drafted this regulation, we thought that is an easy uh, piece of cake, because uh, our ambition was close to zero. zero. Uh, in all other regulations, we have made really uh, very ambitious proposals. And fortunately, most of our ambition are still there. But in the ACER regulation, uh, we just wanted to improve here and there where we uh, found uh, something uh, to be done. For instance, the relationship between the board of regulators and uh, the director. And all of a sudden, it turned out that we needed uh, three trialogues in order to get a political compromise on, on this um, uh, regulation. That was quite astonishing. Uh, no, it was by purpose that we didn't want uh, to change the regulatory setup, uh, because it is working, and uh, I have to give a lot of credit also to Alberto himself, who has set up this uh, uh, agency, uh, and uh, it is working uh, quite well, and therefore we didn't see any need. So, but uh, to conclude, um, the regional approach that we are uh, having uh, in the past and having now uh, also in a, in a more mandatory manner introduced in the system is the guarantor for us uh, for a future development of the market. It can only go uh, via regional cooperation uh, that has to be extended in order uh, then one day uh, to achieve our, our um, uh, ultimate goal, which is a full, fully integrated European energy market. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus Dieser, for this uh, interesting overview, maybe how to put furniture in the um, in the gray zone between the national and the European, where many people always look for the, the extremes, the black and the white. It certainly explains the rollback tentative, maybe on the third package, uh, ASA uh, regulation. Yeah, Alberto, uh, how did this work? Yeah, we are talking about institutions, and uh, ASA is one of those newly created. Uh, um, institutions uh, with the third package, yeah? did you get the keys from uh, the European Commission and uh, now go to Ljubljana and set up an agency? What have you done? Well, uh, yeah, relatively new, even though um, a lot of water has gone behind our bridge. Um, I think the, over these nine, eight and a half years, the agency has actually changed um, its, its nature, not because we did something, but because the market has evolved. And uh, in 2010, when the agency was established, that was, you know, the, the internal market was a project. 
And uh, there was, I think the third energy package was a good package. Um, it proved to be a good one, and I think it, it supported um, well the energy system, the energy sector, over the last, over the last um, 10 years. Um, I think it's sort of um, it got to the point now where um, some of the issues needed to move to the next stage, and I'm sort of really happy that Klaus Dieter has already introduced the you know, the regulatory dimension of the debate uh, for the clean energy package. Uh, I was also surprised that it, you know, the, the agency's regulation attracted a lot of attention, too much more attention than I expected. And maybe the ambition of the, co the, the no ambition of the commission was too ambitious for someone. And I go back to the kind of debate that has popped up now and then, you know, do we need a uh, a European regulator, because that was the essence. Um, the agency was not established as a European regulator. If you ask me today, also with the experience that we had so over this period, uh, Europe does not need a European regulator. If we mean a European regulator, somebody who replaces national regulatory authorities. When it comes to retail markets, I think in the 90s probably there was an ambition to create a European-wide retail market where, you know, in Ljubljana, you can phone up somebody, you know, a, a, a supply in, in Portugal and get the supply. I mean, this is not what happened, okay? Um, there are still cultural differences, justified cultural differences. So the markets are still local, national, even though you want to have free access um, by competing suppliers. But you need to have regulators who are close to consumers. Uh, when also it comes to uh, promoting, for example, consumer engagement when it comes to protecting consumers' rights. So there is still a role, an important role, for national regulators. They're also the ones who understand the local circumstances and therefore can make sure that whatever the agency or whoever is doing at European level, it's also fit for purpose at local level. However, I think it's indisputable, or I believe it is indisputable, but obviously there are people who dispute this, that we're now gone beyond the point of no return when it comes to wholesale markets, when it comes to what I call horizontal networks, you know, the sort of cross-border elements of the networks. And there, I think, it's now almost proven that voluntary cooperation by national regulatory authorities, maybe it's not impossible, it's not the most effective, efficient way. To the extent that even the national regulatory authorities themselves, a couple of years ago, came up to this idea that, you know, the agency should be entrusted with decisions when it comes, for example, to terms and conditions and methodologies which apply across the whole of the Union. Under the network codes, this was sort of unanimous agreement by national regulatory authorities. And, you know, with 28 or soon 27 NRAs, you always find somebody who might have a problem. And, you know, especially with the most contentious ones, um, this was the case. So I think there you do need in my view, to have to step up and to move beyond the, you know, the, 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 so the voluntary collection of, of national regulators. Now, now here now we have an extra challenge because the future will be more decentralized. The future will be more sort of closer to consumer, prosumer, all these new concepts. I mean, I'm pre-digital native, so I'm limited to my, in my understanding what will go on in the future, but it's obviously is a different from the more centralized management of the system. And yet, this will have to develop in a, in, 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 in a way which is consistent across Europe, because at the end, we still want energy to be traded seamlessly across the whole of the Union. And we've almost achieved this. I mean, at the moment, as you, I'm sure all of you are aware, the Dehead market is, is operated as a single area from the Strait of Gibraltar to the Barents Sea. You know, 19 jurisdictions, another four might join at some stage soon. And then we have a few other bits and pieces coming. So do we really believe that this can be sort of managed from a regulatory perspective by 19 NRAs getting together? And so you end talk. Okay. Um, under the third package, the regulatory oversight of these entities was very weak, to use an euphemism. Uh, they've done an excellent job. But every now and then, I think, Intervention is needed to make sure that you know, the job is done properly all the times. And again, do we expect that this can be done 
you know, by 27, 28. I still hope that it would be 28 for a long time, but this is, I'm not betting my money on this. Um, do we really think that this is the most efficient way? Now, interesting enough, the, 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 final, the final version of the, you know, the, the, the compromise text, maybe it's not the most elegant. I wouldn't recommend it for a syllabus in, in English literature, but I think it delivers. It delivers sometimes with a bit more, com you can actually read all the, all the efforts um, and all the struggles there. But, you know, it delivers uh, some more robust oversight of, um, of, uh, of the ENSOs. It delivers um, a better way of approving um, uh, European-wide rules. Um, it delivers a sensible uh, approach to, for example, resource adequacy at regional European level. So it, it actually delivers. For the, the way in which the discussion went at some stage last year, I'm actually quite impressed at how the Commission and the Parliament and some of the member states in the Council managed to bring the discussion back. In, in, you know, in a scenario where, as Klaus Dieter said, you know, no ambition was already too ambitious for someone. So I think we, you know, at the end the boat, the boat came to, the ship came to port. Um, so this is what the agency, you know, looking forward, you know, we'll have to implement the clean energy package. It's the, and we will, I think we will face again and again. And uh, we've seen it by, by the end of the week, hopefully we will issue our decision on the core capacity calculation methodology. And every time you get into this, you know, you, you see this uh, tension between the regional or European dimension and the national dimension. This is still there. And I think we will face it all over again every time. So in the next couple of years, we'll, this will be a, a sort of recurrent theme. Um, the gas package will come at some stage, and I hope, um, it will, I hope it will be more technical, I have to say. And it will not, um, I mean, the, 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 recently we had some very political, but this is what I'm saying, this I hope is yes, done. So not to Russia, yeah. yeah, well, I hope it will be more technical, I really hope, because so we can spare some of the some of the issues that uh, sort of kept um, hostage uh, the clean energy package negotiations. Um, and then I, I just want to spend one last minute on remit, because finally, I mean, we've been preaching about integrity and transparency. Well, we were told that we were in charge of preaching uh, integrity and transparency by the co-legislators uh, of, um, of um, wholesale energy markets. And we've been working on this behind the scenes it has not been very visible for many years. And now, um, I'm not sure, I would say I'm pleased that finally uh, there is a system in place that can identify where market abuse um, happens. And we've seen the French, the Spanish, the Danish, um, the Hungarian, um, soon another big country issuing fines on, uh, on market participants who are allegedly abusing the market. So I think this is finally, it's, 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 to me it's an, an essential part of delivering an internal market. Partly because we want to have integrity and transparency, but also partly because if it is true that energy in an internal market will move according to relative prices, you know, price differentials, if these prices do not reflect the fundamentals, then energy may still, or once again, move in the wrong direction as it happened before we coupled the market. So I think this is an essential part. Not everyone recognizes it. It's mostly, you know, a lot of people consider it a bit of an exotic, um, you know, um, add-on to, to this, maybe even to ambitions for Europe. I mean, I've heard so many times, you know, say, oh, you've developed a Ferrari when you, should have, you could have done something else. I think, you know, to me, either you look into the markets or you don't look into the markets. Um, I just want very final note. One of the sections in my chapter is the three main challenges of the agency over this period were, were resources, resources, and resources, and we're still there. Many thanks, uh, Alberto. And uh, of course, I would like to really uh, encourage everyone to deep dive into the respective uh, chapters of the book. Uh, Philip Lowe's chapter on uh, Brexit. Uh, Klaus Dieter and Maria Leos uh, Casalos uh, chapter on, on the regionalization and of course Alberto's chapter on 
on Asia, yeah, uh, resources, resources, resources. Maybe it's also the fact that you are so efficient. I remember that I asked you, are you doing an impact assessment of the SAP? And you were saying, we already did it. So uh, maybe you don't need more resources because you are so fantastically uh, efficient. Just a joke. Uh, so now uh, we conclude the round of introductions with uh, Dirk. Dirk Busche, uh, so what is the, uh, the energy community is that? A parallel world? Are you the footnote to the to, to the package, uh, or are you part of the institutional setting? So it would be interesting to get this understanding, and then of course uh, you can already uh, prepare your questions to our uh, four distinguished speakers uh, once uh, Dirk has made his his statement. Thanks a lot, uh, Suzanne. And good morning, everybody. I like this. Uh, um, calling the energy community a parallel world. Maybe there'll be a lot of uh, science fiction when we make our way through the energy transition, and maybe we'll also discover some parallel worlds. Um, but I'm afraid the energy community is not one. <laughs> and I try to give some arguments for that. Uh, of course, um, there is the easy ones. Uh, it's the same climate change that we're all facing. It's the same Paris Agreement that we're all under. Um, you could also say, coming back to what uh, Klaus-Dieter Borchert has said, uh, when we talk about uh, regional cooperation and also regional governance that the energy community, despite being outside the EU, is maybe the, the, the regional cooperation scheme with the most solid governance uh, so far in Europe. Um, but I think what is most important when um, I try to make my point of saying that the energy community is indeed part of the same world, uh, also in this area of energy transition, is that uh, we are facing the same challenges and we can learn and we should learn from uh, these uh, challenges and how we cope with them. Uh, what is the most intriguing um, aspect these days of the energy transition, maybe also the most disturbing? It was mentioned uh, by Pascal Lamy. Uh, it has gotten a label, um, the Gilet Jaune. Uh, I think uh, not many people had that on the radar, and all of a sudden uh, they appeared on the streets and the uh, Rond Point of Fra uh, France uh, and uh, Belgium, I understand as well. Um, well, we could have looked uh, back in time and we could have uh, looked uh, further east, uh, for example, to Bulgaria, where in 2013. Um, there were similar demonstra demonstrations which uh, even had uh, fatalities, which brought the first uh, Borisov uh, government down. Also, uh, on high energy prices, uh, so um, that was back then, and uh, that was also further east, and I think we uh, here in uh, Brussels, maybe it's appropriate to say that, uh, that we have uh, neglected uh, that area. Um, we have um, always thought this is kind of an exotic area, um, even though they are member states, but in the end, um, Bulgaria as a member state maybe has more in common with the energy community uh, contracting parties uh, surrounding it, uh, namely uh, a past of uh, communism, socialism, a past that suggests that it's the state who is in charge of uh, taking care of energy um, and especially of keeping the prices down, of keeping the prices affordable and affordable in the context of countries like the energy community countries in Southeast Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, but also the um, adjacent member state, always had a different meaning than it has uh, here in Brussels. Affordable um, has indeed a different uh, meaning if you spend uh, almost your entire income on basic necessities. Uh, as they say in the region, um, it's eating or heating, and there's some uh, truth to that. Um, and I think we also have to keep that in mind, uh, this not only the um, potential for social disruption, uh, but also the, the seriousness of the problem that now materializes here in Western Europe as well. Um, we have to keep that in mind also when we are engaging in a further Europeanization of the energy transition, because people will ask, and they are doing that already, um, so you're defining our energy policy, which we always entrusted historically to, to the state, uh, and then I think we will be held accountable also for what we are doing. So this is only the beginning, and it is probably um, a, um, a challenge that we face together and where we can learn from the experience made in Eastern Europe. In um, the energy community countries, so outside uh, the European Union, maybe um, these uh, similar unrests and uh, social uh, backlashes have been 
gone less noticed even today as, as we speak there there's unrest in countries like Albania where I think yesterday demonstrators tried to get into the uh, prime minister's uh, palace etc so things are happening but again very exotic on, on the fringes of Europe. Um, but maybe what, what distinguishes the energy community countries and maybe, again, also some of the EU member states is um, that uh, they managed to uh, manage in entre guillemets, they managed to cope with the challenge by dodging the energy transition so far. And I'm not talking about the current energy transition, but the, the first energy transition, the one from state-run monopolized markets to liberalized market to open markets. Um, our contracting parties are champions in uh, transposition, so the laws all <coughs> look very nice, but when it comes to really uh, implementing, then uh, indeed um, there is a lot still to be done. Uh, the, uh, prices, but with the result that prices are being kept low, indeed, uh, this a first energy transition, this liberalization has been dodged uh, and as a result uh, because of non-investment, because of a lot of cross-subsidies, because of also remaining subsidies uh, for coal, etc., or the non-internalization of um, externalities, the prices have stayed low. That's probably why uh, also that region with this high potential for social unrest uh, has so far stayed under the radar. Um, but the days will probably come. We have just recently had a discussion also in, in Serbia um, where if one assumes, and this will be come at the latest uh, with the EU accession, um, that there is an emissions trading scheme also in Serbia, so in the energy community, uh, where they um, emit uh, 24 million tons of uh, CO2 per year and we assume a price of 22 euros uh, per ton, then we are at a 25% increase of the energy price, and that, of course, means a lot. This will not go uh, very smoothly, is, is my guess. Um, now, with the second energy transition, with the one that we are talking about and that uh, our book is about as well, I think um, this is one transition that cannot be dodged uh, as easily or maybe not as all, at all. And in the energy community, we see the price now um, of not having gone through the liberalization transition. Um, all the aspects that I mentioned um, that were made essentially to keep the prices low, um, they come at a price, obviously. They are inefficient state monopolies. Uh, which are used by politicians as cash cows. Um, they are not allowed to make profit uh, for that precise reason and uh, not uh, to invest. And the business model is still very much based on, on local coal or lignite, which in the energy community starting this year with the entry into force of the Large Combustion Plants Directive um, has either become illegal, um, it's not uh, old coal-fired power plants, uh, power plants with the high emissions as they have in places like Kosovo or Serbia or Bosnia and Herzegovina are not in line with European law anymore, or non-financeable. Uh, that's what we also see. Um, we also see that the um, support for renewables is uh, very uh, inefficient. They are still, um, many of the countries still base themselves on the old idea that you should um, put in, put feed-in tariffs in. Uh, without auctioning, even though we see cases now where auctions, uh, like in Albania, have brought down the price uh, by half. Um, so that's very efficient and still uh, a lot of local pol politicians uh, insist, uh, for various reasons that I won't go into, um, that they should uh, go through the same experience as, let's say, uh, Germany, a country which obviously can afford mistakes as well. Um, but they say, well, you, you started with this, now let us do the same. While the world has turned and auctions is really in a, a much more efficient way uh, to get renewables um, on the ground, especially in a region that has such a high potential uh, for renewables. Um, my last argument why indeed uh, the energy community is in one world <laughs> with the European Union when it comes to the energy transition um, is a, a, a legal one. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not so saying that against the background of uh, Brexit, but it is of course creating uh, one legal space. Um, the energy community treaty is creating one legal space which 
at the same time creates an internal market which goes beyond the EU. It's a pan-European uh, internal market. Um, and there we also f are facing challenges that brings us to the topic of institution, of governance that we need to address. Um, we need to have that true level playing field also because uh, between the non-EU members and the EU members. I think this call becomes more important now with the energy transition. Um, and it may be considered, uh, I, I think it is, if I uh, consider, uh, count it correctly, it's, it's the last open action point under the energy union to reinforce the energy community, so to make sure um, that the relation between member states and non-EU member states participating in the energy community uh, is really based on the same terms, which allows for market coupling with all the social welfare gains that can be made, for example, between Italy and Montenegro, where we'll have a, an undersea cable very soon, uh, which allows for the same treatment of interconnectors, uh, including gas pipelines, which allows also for the participation of these countries from Ukraine down to the southeast of, of Europe uh, in regional cooperation, for example, on the energy and climate plans, which our countries already started to implement, um, and also requires a very uh, fast implementation of the clean energy for all European <laughs> packages, uh, package which the Commission has already uh, committed to. Um, I think especially that package has a high potential also to um, enhance the energy transition in non-EU countries because of the governance regulation. Uh, the governance regulation is a very innovative tool uh, on how to promote the energy transition. In the energy community, we are very much based on the rule of law, which is a very important and uh, a thing that should, of course, stay. But you cannot kick through the energy transition. Uh, the governance uh, regulation, if properly applied, is probably uh, much more adequate to help also the non-EU countries uh, to achieve our common goal. Thanks a lot. Many thanks, Dirk. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the open question here, will the UK join the energy community maybe one day? Let's wait, yeah? But you have been all very patient, yeah? And many thanks for being so numerous here today for this event, yeah? So it's now up to you to uh, ask questions. And please uh, briefly introduce yourself and uh, uh, tell us uh, who uh, you want to um, direct your question to. Okay, I see a hand there. I see a hand there behind. I see Georg. Okay, uh, let's take a couple. Uh, yes, please here. Uh, yeah, there's two hands there. So okay, let's let's uh, take uh, maybe uh, a couple of questions, five questions, and then we can go for a, a next question, please. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, um, Graham Steele. Um, Senior um, advisor with SARE, the Better Regulation Think Tank here in Brussels. Um, former chair of the board at NSOE, former board member at NSOG, and former EU director with National Grid here in Brussels. So you can probably guess which way I voted in the referendum. Um, so a quick question for Philip, because I can't resist. Um, there's an old saying in English that if you're in a hole, it's a good idea to stop digging. Do you think there's any chance that Theresa May will realize she's in a hole and stop digging in the next 29 days? Well, um, I, I think you've got to look at the situation in which the government is in, whichever, whatever mistakes of negotiation they think they've made or they, they pretend not to have made. And... Uh, for the moment, the end game is uh, Brexit, that is to say, leave. And both leaders of both main parties in the UK want Brexit, and they want it soon, even if there's a transition period. Um, so if, if, the, if, if stop digging means um, changing from that course, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Um, and indeed, um, the maybe one can ask the other question is to to what extent should parts of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party stop digging and recognise that if they want Brexit, uh, they better achieve a treaty to do it. Um, 
whether there is a, even a push towards no deal, I'm not sure that that's a, um, necessarily a, a, a major question. In the end, there could be short-term disruption, but pragmatically on both sides, it will be a question of just resetting the clock and starting again and trying to get the agreement. But given that political will, given the lack of change in the in the in the opinion polls, and in fact an impatience by uh, among the British public for for something to happen, I, I think that's uh, the, the people who are going to stop digging are not necessarily Mrs. May, but the, the extremes, and then. In the longer term, is you know, I, 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 two years ago I was at a dinner with a, with a man who is very s celebrated and one of the leaders of the Brexit campaign, and um, I said to him, "Well, the two things I don't understand about your negotiation tactics and your referendum uh, campaign." In the referendum campaign, you said you want you thought that employment legislation of the European Union has been a major obstacle to economic growth. Why does Mrs. May now say that she is going to improve on employment legislation of the European Union to protect workers? And uh, his reply was, "Well, we wanted the we wanted the vote of those in uh, low income working class areas in." UK, which is a politically acceptable thing to say, but illustrates the degree to which the Brexit campaign was a mixture of all sorts of different motivations from people. I, the second question I asked him, why did you want the UK to leave some of the institutions which actually are, or agencies, which are actually valued in terms of the, throughout the, the, the uh, UK population, for example, aviation safety. <laughs> How many people in the UK want to travel on planes which are on the blacklist <laughs> of, the, <laughs> of the EU? <laughs> no one. <laughs> um, food safety, <laughs> Med medical um, approvals. Why didn't you uh, take a pragmatic line, which normally speaking the UK would do on these issues? He said, no, because we do not want regional uh, 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 regulations. We want international regulations. And I said, well, so you want Chinese or US regulation and rather than EU type regulation. Now, I think I'm optimistic that the pragmatism which is at the basis of most British politics will come back. And as I said earlier, over four or five years maybe in relation to some of the issues discussed on, on integration of European markets, um, then one could see some, some degree of movement there and some not just stop digging but some reconstruction. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Wilson, uh, um, policy analyst at the European Parliament. I have actually uh, questions for uh, two separate questions uh, on different issues. Uh, the first is probably to be answered by, by Dirk, and this is the extent to which um, the, uh, given that the, the, the region, the energy community region, faces a, a series of quite interrelated challenges. Um, to what extent is this uh, made more difficult by the fact that some of those countries are now members of the European Union so, uh, and some are now in the energy community? So in the way the regulatory mechanisms for making sure the energy transition takes place gets kind of fragmented. And if you look at the former Yugoslavia, you had a formally integrated uh, energy system that's now not only broken up, but with uh, some member, a member in, in uh, two members in the European Union, others applying to join realistically, and some not realistically going to join anytime soon. So uh, that's an example. More, more generally, how are the challenges in the region met by the fact that you have these two different regulatory frameworks? As far as the Brexit issue is concerned, and sorry to dwell on this again, I was wondering the extent to which uh, this has fallen um, 
that perhaps we uh, tend to only see this uh, unrealistic uh, approach on, on the UK side of pulling out of everything, when in fact, whenever the issue of agencies or uh, further cooperation was broached by the UK side, because the UK side was never really united, the civil servants took a different approach to the ministers, ministers took different approach from each other, um, but whenever the issue was broached, uh, the, the commission uh, neg negotiator negotiators always had the mandate to say Brexit means Brexit. So you are out means out, which means any issue of agency cooperation is not to be discussed now. This happened with the medicines agency. So um, energy is an issue in which in the UK there is almost no will to really uh, pull out of the energy single market or contradict its provisions. But, because, but it's, it's heading in that direction simply because on both sides we, we see an attitude which is we don't discuss uh, out means out of everything. So that's not going to get us very far. Um, and the risk is, of course, we have a transition period, but the risk is that with a hard Brexit, we, we're left with absolutely nothing except um, some desperate unilateral measures at the last moment. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Bo from Global Energy Interconnection Development Corporation Organization, which is an NGO registered in Beijing. And actually, my question goes to all the panelists. And uh, I think um, talking about the decarbonization, the the cope, and the climate change, actually, it's is obvious that uh, it's a universal topic which need more and more international cooperation. So. Um, I think it is, it is always good to think locally as well as have a global vision. So I was wondering, um, especially to Mr. Philip, actually, because he mentioned the word interconnection for several times, because our organization, uh, our mission is to facilitate the interconnection domestically, intercontinentally, and intercontinentally. So uh, I was wondering, do you have any idea about what kind of role Europe will play for the energy transition for the whole world because it's a universal topic. And uh, in, in other words, what kind of contribution will Europe uh, made to the rest of the world, especially for Africa? Because actually we think, we, we think the renewable energy resources in Africa, in West Asia will be quite helpful for the energy trans transition in Europe. Thank you very much. On the, uh, on the issue of institutional framework that, uh, that we are uh, to discuss here, uh, I would judge an institutional framework in electricity on, uh, on two dimensions. First is, do we get the optimal dispatch in the, uh, in the European system? And here I would still see that, for example, if the wind is blowing in Germany, we don't get the Polish coal-fired power plants to, uh, to essentially phase down. Um, and the second one is in terms of optimal investment. Here I would say currently the picture is even more uh, uh, or, or, or even less shiny. That is, for example, we are getting all sorts of power plants financed in different member states based on national mechanisms that could easily be replaced by imports. For example, Germany building uh, reserve plants while they could potentially import from, uh, from Austria to some degree. So do you expect that with the, uh, with the uh, force package and, uh, and the rules that you put in place now, that we are essentially getting getting out of uh, uh, out of this or do we uh, do we stay essentially with a system where we do not manage to get an optimal dispatch and optimal de uh, investment decision in the european electricity system thank you so much uh, my name is maximo micinelli i'm the new director of center on regulation in europe and i have two questions the first one is very simple after elections where do you see the main challenge of the current energy governance, starting from the governance, the union, to all the institutions we have? And I think, Susanne, you mentioned also consumers, and it's very interesting to see that link. So where, where do we need to defend the governance we have? The second question is, we, we're talking a lot about the clean energy package, and we also have the vision that the Commission managed to put forward. So between 2030 and 2050, this is a, this is a question for, for you, Philip, and also for Mr. Walshak. Where do we, are we heading? Are we heading to more empower existing institutions today? Are we heading to rebuilding a bit the system and, and, and trying to uh, uh, match the national and local? 
or you think we will have a completely different system, completely reset system. It's just a bit of guessing, but well, I want to, to know. Thanks. Let's uh, produce the usual lie in Brussels, which is silly. Bref, um, uh, I, I, I agree on the, on the Brexit negotiation. On both sides, you had the issue of, uh, on the one hand, we don't want to be in the institutions of the EU, but on the other hand, we don't want, in the EU side, we don't want any cherry picking. That, that was understandable at the stage of a withdrawal agreement where one side, the UK, did not want to be part of any institutions. But as then it started to be discussed what the future relationship was, <laughs> then the, there, were, there was some degree of rolling back of the principle that we want to do everything on our own. And there, uh, naturally, the politically, was, the reaction was clear. Um, Listen, you, you can't leave and then just take, come back into the things which you want to come back into if you don't accept the institutional framework. And um, don't forget that if it, if it was on, on the medical agency or any other agency, you do get immediately into the issue of the institutional uh, powers concerned. And there, uh, if the UK had been more pragmatic on that side, I am convinced that the EU would have been more pragmatic as well. Now, that may come in the next three or four years, but it's not going to come immediately because of the way the negotiation has gone on. Uh, Europe's contribution to, to uh, the, internet, the global transition in energy, I think, frankly, we've got to be clear uh, on, on emissions. Uh, uh, Europe has led the world in trying to, to deal with uh, climate change. Uh, Joss is in the room. He, he was one of the people leading the world, <laughs> and still it has been. And uh, from that point of view, intellectually uh, and politically, it's been a very important driver for recognition of a change. And the Paris Agreement, too, it, as itself, uh, from, the, from the Paris Agreement onwards, uh, in Europe, it was, it was this, an agreement made in Europe um, that changed business expectations worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. And that change has been extremely important. Now, unfortunately, Europe's uh, percentage, of, percentage of emissions which it produces is, is extraordinarily low. I mean, I'm not sure whether it's 7 or 8% now. It is predicted to be 4% of total emissions in in 2030, um, well, we're going to have to use a lot more intellectual uh, firepower in order to ensure that China, India, and the US uh, move in the same direction. And maybe, maybe that firepower is already being used. Maybe we also were helped in India and China by the, by the fight against air pollution, which is uh, strengthened the arguments for, for moving away from coal. Um, do, you, do, you think, do we think that um, Europe can make a better contribution to um, infrastructure uh, connections in Africa and elsewhere? Well, yes, Europe has been historically, maybe as a whole, the biggest donor. The Chinese um, uh, present cooperation in Africa is, is, is impressive in many areas, but... Um, European development cooperation has uh, concentrated on a much more global approach, not just building, building interconnections, but also making markets work. And that's been very important. And that, I think that, that w it will go on in that respect. On the, I'm going to leave the issues which uh, Georg uh, raised on, on the, the electricity market design to... to, um, to um, uh, to deter in others, 
just want to say one thing. I, I started, when I started with the European Commission, I started in the European Coal and Steel Community. And um, you were right, absolutely, Susanna. At the beginning, it was, all, it was a lot about political security. But I worked for 10 years on reconversion programs, lending money to companies to re-employ coal and steel workers in the Tsar in Scotland, in Wales, in, in, um, in, the, in Lorraine. Uh, and there was a social dimension to that. Pascal mentioned it in a much more global context. But if we expect people to move away from coal, um, well, Europe did it over 20 or 30 years. <laughs> so if we say to Poland and to India and China, immediately stop coal-fired power stations. Well, let's think about the social component of it there. Now, on the issue of uh, what's going to happen after elections, I'd, li I'd really like to know. I, 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 but one thing is clear. Um, there has been a traditional faith, traditional in the U.S., and the UK for decades, but recently put into question, in making markets work for the benefit of consumers. But uh, don't forget the UK has committed itself to retail price regulation uh, in the energy sector recently. Uh, my argument against that is simply that having tried to create a competitive market, but then cutting yourself off from the European market, and therefore you're a major source of contestability to the incumbents, you're almost obliged to have price regulation because there's not enough dynamic of competition in the market to make it work. And I think that's another debate which is going to go on for a number of years in a number of our countries. Having persuaded France for over several years to give up price regulation, then we discover the main, the main proponents of uh, more competition are doing the same. Just as we said, stop doing per power purchase agreements to many of the countries in Eastern Europe. And now we realize that, uh, yes, uh, competitive auctioning over a long term of electricity requirements is the right way to go. So we've got to get our language correct and be logic with us, logical with ourselves. Um, I, I think that um, I think that there is a, a plenty of momentum in the in in Europe to move forward, uh, but I'd emphasise the need to do it pragmatically, and as Dieter emphasised, do it regionally. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, Philip has already said a lot. Uh, what I only can subscribe to. I want uh, to focus on three questions here. Uh, one uh, complementary argument to the international side, um, and here more from the energy side. Uh, what uh, we are seeing today is that um, a number of countries are coming to us and asking us, how have you managed this? How have you managed the integration of renewables? How have you managed regional cooperation? The North Americans, they are coming and saying, in North America, it's impossible uh, to do uh, a 10-year network development plan for the whole country. It's impossible. How is it working? Is it working? And these kind of things. So this is something I think uh, the Jap uh, Japan is coming to us because they also want to learn from the clean energy package what uh, uh, they can uh, import. And this is, of course, one thing that we now uh, should offer uh, in our international relationships, and we do so in our uh, international strategy, uh, that we uh, want uh, to assist those countries um, that um, are asking for, for information and uh, also some advice. At the same time, and Philip has said that quite rightly, I mean, there are some uh, special areas and special focus, and Africa is definitely one you have seen or heard uh, the speech of President Juncker, uh, the last uh, speech in the European Parliament um, to the State of the Union. 
uh, where he uh, mentioned Africa. And I think uh, the energy um, policy is maybe uh, the most forceful tool that we can um, apply. In the sense, as Philip said, uh, not so much now uh, working, uh, as um, you have mentioned uh, and China is doing, also on the way of intercontinental uh, interconnections, but uh, developing the markets and mainly decentralized markets there, using the renewable resources that are, are there and connecting the energy uh, system to other policy areas, uh, agriculture, um, developing uh, small and mid-sized uh, industries around. And for all this, you need the energy. And therefore, I think this is something that we want to bring uh, to Africa in a, a comprehensive uh, plan. Uh, but then um, there are new areas like uh, development of hydrogen, LNG, where uh, Japan and the United States are interested. So there we could also cooperate in this uh, sense. And um, so there's a lot uh, what we, will, we are thinking uh, quite uh, now on how uh, to improve and also to adjust our international uh, cooperation strategy. Then, um, Georg, um, uh, on optimal dispatch, uh, I think that at least uh, we have made uh, one uh, bold step into that direction that we might get an optimal dispatch, but future will show whether we are right or wrong. And this is what we have said, um, the new uh, bidding zone configuration uh, that uh, uh, we have now installed a new uh, procedure because it also links to the optimal investment. If we do not get the bidding zone right, uh, then we will always have a problem uh, with the optimal dispatch and we will uh, also not attract the investments there uh, where it is uh, needed. Optimal investment also has to do, as Philip just said, um, the, the question of regulated prices. I am less uh, uh, convinced that regulated prices have to be there uh, for the reason you have said. Uh, I've, I mean, we have not achieved what we wanted. That was to get rid of regulated prices uh, at once for a certain period. But what we have achieved, and maybe that's even a smarter way, ex post, in my opinion, it is to say, okay, you can stay with your regulated prices under the condition that the following conditionalities, which will enhance competition, uh, are fulfilled. So if you are not fulfilling these conditions, you cannot have regulated prices. There are uh, conditions like it has to be a consumer choice. For, you have to offer a regulated price and a, a, and a market price. The French will always majoritarily uh, go for the regulated price. That's their culture. But, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, uh, there, there, there are the instruments uh, in order to first get the market right and only, and then you see that regulated prices will come as a last resort, especially when you then have market failures in somewhere. Uh, so we have the hope that uh, we will get there. But it is a very uphill battle, as you can see, because uh, at the end of the day, it is then for us to enforce this, and, and that might be uh, a bit uh, cumbersome. Um, then um, on your uh, question, um, more powerful institutions are needed, uh, or a completely new system between 2030 and 2050? I don't think so. I think now what we are already over the decades, what we are doing when you look from package to package and now to, to where we are, Horizon 2030, uh, it is, um, I think it's a, maybe not a straight line, but it is a, quite a corridor in which we are operating uh, in electricity and, and gas at least. Um, and that is uh, continued. From 2030 to 2050, I think um, the, there will be a slight uh, shift uh, in priorities, which then becomes really the decarbonization. And uh, all what we are doing already going into that direction, but if we really want to be uh, at our targets in 2050, and Pascal Lamy this morning said that it should be a zero, um, or 100% decarbonization, um, then, of course, uh, we have to uh, change some uh, paradigms here. 
And uh, it is true that um, coal and lignite is then something that uh, should not figure in the energy mix anymore. Whether we will uh, make it has to do also with a strong government. And uh, I agree with uh, Philip, we cannot from one day to the other uh, just uh, top down saying, and now uh, it's ending. First, we have not the competency, but even if we had those, you cannot do it. I think the way that the Commission now is chosen by offering uh, uh, to the regions uh, in transition, coal regions in transition, a platform where we help them to attract new businesses, uh, going also project by project, implementing concrete projects that show also to the regions and the people living there that a transition is happening to their benefits and not just throwing money and then turning a blind eye on those, but really actively participating in the transition is a most promising uh, way, way to go. So in a nutshell, I think uh, we, we will continue our, our path, but with an acceleration of uh, decarbonizing. That is also true for gas. In my view, uh, there will be a moment after 2030 uh, where um, the natural gas, as we know it today, will not stay in the, in the business or on the markets. It will be decarbonized, and uh, we had uh, somebody from Norway here. Uh, Norway is already preparing now for that uh, through um, uh, carbon capture and storage. So the, there are already developments starting today, or we want to develop also renewable gases. Uh, uh, for the future. So everything is starting today, but it will then mostly played out uh, uh, in the period between 2030 and 2050. Thank you. I would obviously come back to your question, um, which goes to the heart of how European energy policy and law is being exported uh, to non-EU countries. Um, the way how the energy community functions, where is, there's one single market, um, and then there's two parallel uh, legal orders, so to say. And uh, the first thing um, that we have and we're currently working on is to make sure that these parallel orders are in sync, uh, not only technically. Um, obviously, uh, there must be the same rules and no distortions. Uh, I mentioned before the fact that the um, ETS does not apply to non-EU countries, which do access and have a right to access the internal market. That's obviously a distortion because they can sell their electricity cheaper. Think of Ukraine, uh, think of countries um, in Southeast Europe as well. But also the level of enforcement, the level of taking serious the commitments that the countries um, have taken upon themselves must be at least similar uh, to the one in the EU to ensure this parallelism. And then we have indeed uh, an issue on if we accept that there are two parallel um, regimes which are the same, um, but in parallel, you will like this because you started with a parallel, with a parallel world. We, we have to build the bridges between, uh, on the interface between the EU and the non-EU countries. And that's also a very technical question which I will not go into. Um, but it all comes down to the idea that the export of European policy and law is a one-way street. Um, which is not functioning. If it's only going in one way, obviously you don't catch the, the reflux. You cannot couple a market between North Macedonia and uh, Bulgaria if that is only an obligation on North Macedonia, but not Bulgaria because Bulgaria under EU law can say, well, I'm not bound by anything that does not affect two member states. Uh, so these kind of things we have to, we have to fix. Um, in the energy community, we also believe this is a technicality until this came to the commission and then through the commission uh, to the council where the commission needed a mandate. Uh, and I think pretty much as in the ACER discussion, um, everybody realized that what um, was clear over the last 10 years and nobody challenged, namely the fact that there is a joint internal market, all of a sudden raised many questions and people were going back uh, to square one. Uh, and that discussion also includes, obviously, uh, which institutions are in charge, uh, especially when member states and non-EU member states are involved. And the obvious answer to that is ACER, and that's the time for me to pass on the mic. 
Well, the, 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 the reason actually, I think, uh, I mean, at least my reading of the latest text, the, the, the compromise text on, on the ESA regulation, there is actually a, a very important provision with respect, for, with respect to this bridge. Because until now, on the energy community side, when, when, when we, in the context of disagreement between regulators on, on the two sides of this uh, bridge, um, I think the energy community had already put in place provisions which allow the agency to take decisions in case of disagreement between a, contra a, a, a national regulatory authorities of a contracting party and the national regulatory authorities of a European Union member state. Now, my understanding, my reading of the text is that now there is a mirroring provision also in the new ASA regulation that under certain conditions the agency will be able to take decisions when it comes to disagreement between the two sides of the bridge. So this will have to be implemented, uh, but at least that legal obstacle has now been sort of removed. Uh, one final word, because I think most of the issues, uh, most of the questions have already been asked, uh, answered, and I know we're running out of time. Optimal dispatch is based on pricing, prices giving the right signals. And if we have billions of redispatching costs, it means that the prices are not uh, making their, uh, their, their job. So um, it's partly a matter of the configuration of bidding zones. Um, we believe that's a large part. Uh, but I think the market design is fundamentally correct. We just need to bring it to the, you know, to the end of, of, of the line and realize that you know, there's still a job to be done. The, we had, from the agency side, we're trying at least to highlight where the problems are. But obviously, it is not um, for the agency, but it's definitely for um, the institutions in the countries and at European level to try to deliver the, 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 a market with prices that reflects the fundamentals and therefore they give the right signals for optimal dispatch. Thanks to all uh, speakers for this interesting journey through institutions and let's give them a hand of applause. I think there's uh, certainly a, a lot of questions unanswered. Some of the speakers here and authors are, are staying with us, so you can ask them in uh, the, the lunch break uh, later on. Uh, I would also like to mention that the editor, Arnu Osold, is, is here. I saw him uh, before, so there is a couple of copies if you want to invest. And the authors, if they have to leave earlier, like you, Klaus Dieter, take your, make sure you, you take your copy uh, with you. And now, uh, Rosita was mentioning decarbonization acceleration. Uh, this is not meant as cutting too much uh, of the time of the panel with this name. Uh, and now I would like to invite in Jean-Michel and uh, let's have the lunch break a little later uh, as to ensure this panel uh, also has its uh, decent time. I hand over to Jean-Michel Glachon. Ladies and gentlemen, as you see, I was needing fine tuning. And the third person being Dolph Gillen. Ah, well, Dolph is there. <laughs> Very welcome, Dolph. You can take a seat. So, decarbonization, uh, we have to, we should uh, go to minus 40 in 2030, so roughly 10 years from now, and then neutral uh, uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. So, 
the first comment is, is it so easily doable or is it daunting? Because it's easy to make a statement, we will do, but whom will do? Will it be done at the EU level? Will it be done at the member state level? Could external um, uh, countries help EU to reach this target? Will Asia or US help us or not at all? And also, uh, what tool will we use? How will we do this? Will we do still a technology push like we did with renewable? Will we push other technologies, like suggesting by a closed editor one minute ago and by the gas industry yesterday? We will push this, yes, you will see. Will we use energy efficiency? Will we use carbon price finally, or is carbon price uh, something we even do not think to use? And what kind of other technology innovation do we expect? And of course, coming from uh, Dirk, but uh, Georg will come back too, uh, what is the social willingness to play that we expect, or what is the social innovation which can help doing it? We have three speakers, as you can see. Jos Delbecke, former director of climate at European Commission and still principal advisor. Georg Rachmann, responsible for energy research here at Bruegel. And Dolph Gillen, being director of uh, innovation and something else which escaped my mind, uh, innovation and technology. At uh, IRENA, IRENA Bonn, as you know, IRENA is a popping uh, international organization. Uh, I did attend its annual meeting in Abu Dhabi uh, one month ago, having a mess, huh? 1,200 people. Uh, it's, it, it's really a world gathering of, of brains, decision makers. A, a fantastic thing was born with IRENA. We will start with Joss. Each of them will have roughly 10 minutes to say what they think. Joss will tell us what we did in the EU, what we did so well, what we are going to do in 2030. Do we know what we can do from 2030 to 2050? What are the tools we might use or should use? And what what is the known and the unknown in, in all of this is big uh, trajectory. Georg is willing to emphasize distribution effects, um, social willingness to play, and all these uh, daunting questions that Dirk gently said to be a yellow vest French question. That's why I'm totally black today. <laughs> Maybe I am, I am showing my respect for the 12 people having been killed in this, in this adventure, and if I remember correct, 2,000 wounded, and if I remember correct, 6,000 arrested by the police and investigated. It's, it's an incredible thing in France. Huh? And then, uh, Georg, I said, and then Dolph, but I think that Golf being responsible for innovation should tell us uh, why we did get so much renewable finally, and not only in EU, but in many other places, what is expecting renewable to deliver us till 2030? And after 2030, is still banking uh, renewable will do all the job, or we will have other um, major technology push, or other things, not a push, but a pull. Are you all okay? Uh, when you will have spoken 10 minutes, I will gently remind you that uh, you have to give the, the floor, which is a microphone, to the next. So we start with the EU. What we did so well, and where are we going, Joss? Okay, thank you, Jean-Michel, and good morning to all of you. I think it was said in the previous session already, the Paris Agreement uh, changed the perspective radically, and uh, the role of the EU was basically to demonstrate what we have been doing. And if I can have the slides up, I uh, uh, tried to summarize my story in three, four slides. Are they coming? Um, they are, I, I'm told. Because uh, what, what it is that we did is that basically we decarbonized up to 22% since 1990. And at the same time, we increased economic growth. 
And I think that that uh, reality was a, a very important one. If I can have the next slide, please. Yeah, no. Ah, okay, there is a clicker, there is a clicker, okay. So, that is what I wanted to tell you. Um, our emissions went down with 22%, our GDP went up with 53%, and basically, talked as an economist, per unit of GDP, which is the green line, we reduced the carbon content per unit of GDP with almost 50%. Of course, there are uh, some of you are going to say, ah, but trade, we import um, uh, less uh, or more goods that instead of producing themselves, we import them from China, etc. Now, recent research confirms that this is happening because even if we import more energy intensive and carbon intensive goods from outside uh, Europe, at the same time, we compensate that to a very uh, performance exports uh, that is low carbon in nature. So the correction that needs to be made to something like this is very uh, limited. So that was a very important slide when we were in, um, in uh, Paris because a lot of emerging economies were very concerned that it would kill their economic growth and it is all about the quality of economic growth. So we have a raft of measures in the EU uh, but the most important one is the emissions trading system. Uh, because it covers some 45% of the emissions. And basically, uh, as is shown on the graph, uh, between 2005, when we started, and 2017 today, we have reduced our emissions with 26%. Nowhere else we were reducing our emissions uh, that importantly. And we continue that tendency up to the 40, uh, minus 43% in 2030, that is enshrined in the law, based on 2005. So that is quite a, a, an important uh, issue. And of course, I know that many of you have been saying, ah, but is the carbon market working? Because the prices were uh, quite uh, uh, fluctuating. And indeed, we had low prices uh, for a too long period, uh, the fallout of Lehman Brothers, where we brought us prices very low. But despite that, our emissions went down with 26%, and that is ultimately what matters. So the prices went down, and now in the latest part of our legislation, we made a major correction, and that is one of the lessons we learned, that once you get started with a policy, you have to modify and accommodate that policy en cours de route, because there is always an unexpected event. And the unexpected event that we experienced here was the Lehman Brothers uh, crisis and the fallout in terms of industrial production. So there was an oversupply of allowances in the market that in the last review of our legislation, we could take out. And prices are today, again, at the levels of where they should be and where they were in the range 15 to uh, 25 euros. So the first lesson would be, you know, start doing things, but learn by doing and modify en cours de route. Now, um, the summary of what we have been doing, in fact, since, 2000, uh, since 1990, which is the start year of climate action, uh, that is the United Nations Convention that we started in 1990, that is the record of where we are today and where we are going, which means that between 1990 and 2005, our emissions went down a little bit, you know, half percent per year at best. But once we started our policy in 2005, our emissions went down to where we are today with minus 22 percent in 2017. That means that instead of a half percent per year, we reduce our emissions with one and a half percent per year. And in the meantime, as you know, for 2030, we agreed to go to minus 40%, which means that if we are not modifying our policy, we are going to end up way above the minus 40%. So we will have to tighten our policies, and there are always optimists and pessimists of where we are today. Uh, but irrespective of that, we will have to bring it down, and we will increase our annual reduction from 1.5% close to 2%. And even if we implement totally the renewable 
and energy efficiency objectives, as we ruled them recently, we would go to 2.5% per year, which would bring us very close to the trajectory that we agreed we would do for 2050. At least that is what we agreed at the Paris context. We will have a lot of debate about the long-term strategy, but that will require, again, depending on the optimists and the pessimists, almost a doubling of what we are doing already now. So, to cut it short, um, we have been curbing the trend up to now. We have ruled that we will continue that trend, but then in 2030, we will need to do something more. So, um, the lesson is that you have to go gradual, that you start with a half percent, increase to one and a half percent, we are above the two percent, and then we will have to go for the three and a half of, uh, or four uh, percent. So going, learning by doing, going gradual, and one element, and that is the reply to the gilet jaune uh, question that we had this morning, also by Pascal Lamy, what is behind our ETS and our entire uh, legislation is that there is a strong element of redistribution. In fact, the allowances under the ETS are being redistributed up to 12%. So instead of the allowances going to the member state, 12% is being rechanneled in favor of those who have the most intensive changes in their uh, energy uh, uh, structure ahead of them. There is also uh, lots of things that we have like a modernization fund uh, where we al allocate in favor of those going for renewable energy or energy efficiency, a number of uh, uh, significant amounts of money. So we reschedule in favor of those with the most important challenges ahead, up to two, three billion a year. And that is the redistribution, addressing the redistributive effects amongst member states is at least what we addressed in the European context. Remains, of course, the social context, and that is where the Gilets Jaunes is appealing on, but what was just said about uh, coal mining regions that need, needs rescheduling, I can tell you that we get a lot of questions from our Chinese counterparts with, which, with whom we are intensifying our discussions about these redistributive issues and about how to have a common policy within which you are uh, catering for those who are in most important needs. Of course, as was indicated by, uh, by Pascal Lamy also this morning, after 2030, we will need many more policies. We could even say between now and 2030, we intensify the policies that we have been putting in place on ETS, on the renewables, on energy efficiency, on cars, on fuels. But as of 2030, then we come into industrial commodities, steel, cement, chemicals, that will have to be produced with a much less carbon content, and that will require a lot of innovation. That is why I think it's absolutely pertinent to stress that innovation is important not only in the energy sector, but also in the energy consuming uh, sector. And so uh, just to cut the story short and to sum up, what uh, did we do in Europe? We learn to go gradual and gradually to tighten up, to accommodate en cours de route, and then to uh, address the redistributive issues for the future. Otherwise, you may leave behind a number of regions where we have a good example to show that, in, in, for example, in the coal mining regions of the Benelux or from uh, uh, France or, or from Spain or from the UK, we restructured those coal mining regions successfully, but it took us a lot of money and a lot of time. And that is what we have to calculate into the uh, uh, changes that we are planning for for the future. So thank you uh, very much, Jean-Michel. No, thanks to you. It, it's a fantastic uh, overview of the topic. And of course, you did notice that uh, Joss is always very dynamic and very ambitious, even, even in future ambition. Now, Georg, you are the youngest of the panel, and uh, uh, you would like to tell us something about redistributive effect and maybe pain of this process. Please go. 
Uh, yes, uh, um, I would also like to, to refer to, uh, to essentially my chapter of the, uh, of the book, which is on distributional effects, and uh, we were quite lucky to essentially come up with this topic at, uh, at that point in time. Now, um, when, when thinking about decarbonization, one typically starts out with two questions. What's the most efficient pathway? So kind of which sectors should contribute how much and how quickly? And the other question then, what's the most effective policies to essentially bring those sectors to, uh, to decarbonize along those way? And it became quite apparent last year uh, in particular that acceptability to the population is another element that, uh, that needs very careful uh, monitoring and also being implemented inside the policies in order to ensure a um, resilient transition. Now, so we have been reminded the, the very hard way that carbon prices have distributional consequences and, uh, and my role here in the, in the panel is to, to remind you essentially how important it is to look into distributional effects. We have very ambitious targets, so uh, uh, just showed them, we are talking in the long-term climate strategy of the EU of net zero emissions by, uh, by 2050 potentially. And that will require really intrusive policies. So if you look into the, uh, into the decarbonization models that are out there, some of them only solve in, uh, with carbon prices in the order of 1,000 euros per ton. So 1,000 euros per ton is um, significantly more than, uh, than what, we see, uh, what we see currently around. So that really, whether it's 500 or 1,000 euros, in a sense, doesn't matter. It's a lot, and that's what uh, what the models essentially imply in terms of carbon price for uh, for full decarbonization. So, such carbon prices or similar policies, be it standards or um, uh, uh, or subsidies, will have significant distributional side effects. And so, in the in the book, essentially, we try to explain why poor and rich households are differently affected by uh, by climate policies. And let's start with some economic basis, uh, just because I'm an economist, and uh, that's that's where we come from. Um, so, four arguments. First, um, low uh, low income households value today's consumption more than uh, tomorrow's consumption. So that's why they benef benefit significantly less from long payback time. So if you invest today in energy efficiency as a, as a rich household, it might pay off for you. If you're a poor household, you would rather use this money today for, uh, for some basic need. If you're a poor household, you find it much more difficult to borrow money to do some investments. So you cannot really easily go out, uh, get money from the bank and buy a Tesla in order to be able to, uh, to essentially not have to pay the high diesel prices. You have to use the diesel still in your car because you don't get uh, the, the money borrowed. The third point is, in your share of consumption, high carbon uh, products are much higher share. You use much more money for heating, for electricity, so products that used to be high carbon, so therefore any policy that increases the price of those high carbon assets is essentially hurting you much more than, uh, than a rich household. And finally, typically you, uh, uh, a poor household, by very definition, draws much less income from, uh, from capital and land, and at least for land, we are pretty sure that with full decarbonization, the land sector is going to play a significant role there very likely land prices are going to increase. So land owners might become richer through decarbonization while the uh, rest of the population might not be. Now, so there is a couple of really fundamental reasons why decarbonization uh, has distributional effects and that only essentially materialize through the policies that we, uh, that we then introduce, for example, carbon prices. Of course, non-action is not the answer to that. So we, we cannot say, uh, okay, if we, if we don't do decarbonization, there, there is a kind of a trade-off between climate policy and, uh, and equity, uh, which is not the case in our view because doing nothing on climate will cause climate change, and climate change has even more regressive effects than, uh, than climate policies because poor people will be hurt more by climate change than rich people because they have less capability to adapt. Um, what we, say, what we are saying is essentially that distributional effects can be remedied because uh, we see essentially three big determinants of, uh, of distributional effects. One is which sectors do you prioritize? Now, if you prioritize basic needs sectors like, uh, like electricity and, uh, and heating will primarily fall on, uh, uh, on lower income households, 
if you prioritize aviation, it's less likely to be the case. The second one is in terms of policy. There is some literature out there that uh, um, still very scarce and much more in our view needs to be done there that essentially says that if you use a tax instead of a standard, it's actually a good thing in terms of distributional consequences because people that uh, um, um, uh, people would not be, uh, so poor people would find it very difficult to, uh, to buy something that a standard forces them to do at a very high price, uh, while rich people can, so for them the standard wouldn't matter, for poor people it would, but the tax is a, uh, has less distributional effects. Uh, and, the, and the third point, and that's the most important point in my view, because um, uh, here we already have real world examples on, on what things can go wrong, is the design of the policies. The design of the climate policies itself, so if we have an emission trading system, for example, has tremendous effects on, the, uh, 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 on, uh, on distribution. So we brought up uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the chapter the example of the, uh, of the emission trading system, and um, if you want, with the, uh, with the significant amount of, uh, of free allowances handed out to, uh, uh, to, uh, to companies and the relatively significant pass-through rates of, uh, of cost, um, you kind of can see that uh, um, uh, between 2013 and 2017 about 25 billion euros ended up with, uh, with essentially companies that, uh, that stayed there and were essentially a mechanism that people had to pay and, and companies benefited from. So the, the last point obviously is maybe we cannot deal with all the issues of uh, distributional effects through making better policies. Maybe we also have to do some compensation. And uh, there is a lot of discussion now. You also have potentially seen what is going on in the US here about finding good ways to, um, uh, to compensate households for the distributional effects of, uh, of climate policies. Uh, again, an area where much more research is, uh, is going to be needed to understand whether we want to do lump sum transfer, so everybody getting, uh, getting a check of a thousand euros, or whether we prefer to do it through the social contribution system or other systems. So a wide area where, uh, where we have been uh, too lazy in the, uh, in the last 10 years and where we need to do more simply for the reason that with full decarbonization that we envisage, the implicit carbon price is something in the order of uh, 500,000 euros per ton. So main recommendation at the, at the very end, evaluation of distributional effect should become normal in, uh, in climate policy making. So we should understand what's happening in order to be able to compensate. And uh, uh, going beyond that, distributional effects should become one of the design criteria of climate policies. And I keep it with that. Thank you, Georg. Very convincing. Um, a lot of uh, food for thought, as we used to say. The only caveat is that uh, you have not been uh, working enough and you have been lazy in the past 10 years. I didn't notice it, but I'm living in Florence, so you, you, you can do what you want in Brussels. So um, I have to get a closer watch on, on you. Uh, yes, that's true, huh? And uh, Dolph now, uh, technology push, innovation, what did work, what will work, and what do we need to, to reach this uh, carbon neutrality? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Michel. Um, I And thank you for your kind words about ARENA and the introduction. Um, I was a little bit late this morning, uh, because this morning, together with the uh, European Commission and also NSOE, thank you very much, we uh, launched a new report, Innovation Landscape for a Renewable Powered Future, Solutions to Integrate Variable Renewables. It's a report and it's uh, 30 innovation briefs that will, will be launched. Uh, we launched four today and, and the other 26 will follow. And what we, what we say in there is you have, of course, new technologies. But the innovation does not only come from technology. You need to combine that technology with new market designs and new regulation, with new operational practices, and with new business models. And it's the combination of these four elements, systemic innovation, that gives you the transition. And... Um, to, to, to take a st step back, so on a, on, a, on a global level, we think that 90% of the effort for uh, climate mitigation needs to come from energy efficiency and 
renewables. And uh, you, that is also very much the case if you look into the new, the, the latest uh, scenarios that the European Commission uh, has issued, which were already uh, mentioned. Um, today, um, Europe, or last year, Europe had 17.5% uh, renewables in its gross final energy consumption. It had 32.3% renewables in power generation. That is already for power generation, a, a very uh, significant uh, achievement, but it's only a start. We need to grow from this 32% now to 55% by 2030 and to 85% by 2050, if we want to be on that path. And so that is where, where that, that uh, uh, systemic innovation then becomes very uh, important. But if you compare the, the the numbers for power sector and the numbers for end use sectors, then you see that there is a challenge in the end use sectors. So how do we achieve a transition in buildings, in industry and in transport? That is now the key challenge. And that's where uh, we think, and also the Commission thinks, that electrification is really important. So we're going to have electric vehicles, we're going to have heat pumps, we're going to electrify a lot of the industrial processes, either directly or indirectly through hydrogen, through e-fuels, etc. That, um, that still requires also some, some effort on, on, on bringing costs down and making sure that the right uh, policy uh, uh, frameworks are in place. So, I mean, a typical thing in, in transport sector is, of course, uh, you if you really want to apply smart charging in the future, it means the car needs to be connected to the electricity grid anytime it's parked. So you're going to need a, an, a charging point at your home. You need a, a charging point on the street. You need a charging point uh, at your office. So uh, that means you need three times as many charging points or maybe five times as many charging points as you have cars. So putting that infrastructure in place and making sure that it's, it's a smart infrastructure that, that gets a price response and where the charging response to, to that is, is that there's still some, some uh, work to be done. Um, it was mentioned uh, we, we need an, an, a further acceleri acceleration of the CO2 emission reduction in the coming decades. So uh, between, uh, uh, if we reach the 20% target in, in 2020 and we have minus 40 in 2030, we're doing roughly 2% a year in that period. <laughs> if we then want to go from uh, the 60% that is left to zero in 2050, so 60% over 20 years means we need 3% a year. So that is, that is uh, a significant uh, acceleration. Uh, of course, from a precautionary principle, then you say, well, can't you front load some of that? And in practice, of course, that is happening. Because if you take the combined efficiency target and renewables target, the expectation is that together that will uh, deliver roughly 46% emissions reduction by 2030. So it's already more than the 40%, uh, which, which is the objective. Uh, so, and of course, in 2023, uh, there will be uh, uh, an, an, an another look at these objectives. And, and let's see where we are uh, at that moment, whether we can have even more ambitious targets. So, um, but, but uh, uh, the acceleration is also a little bit um, of a challenge because, of course, what is left is more and more difficult to decarbonize. We've done, we've done the, the coal power plants by then. We're left with uh, airplanes, uh, ships, uh, some of the industrial processes. And um, there are some, some ideas now what could be done and some early trials what could be done. But going from these early trials to massive deployment uh, is, is, will not be easy, but is essential. So 
uh, that 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 R and D, our D and D component will also be critical, and that needs to be put in place now to actually make that happen. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those three fantastic entries, but but they are not the same as you can see. Eh? I do not say that they contradict, but. I'm sure they are not the same. Anyway, I want to give power to the people. So, Paul, is for you. Ask your questions. You need a microphone? Take mine. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have a quiz. My name is Rainer uh, Lütkus. I'm a EU correspondent for Energate in Germany. So, on the title of this... Uh, Conference is a year ahead of the 20s. So what shall we do uh, next, as if I understood correctly? And um, as I understood, Mr. Zachman thinks that we should um, You should now, work more. Huh? <laughs> you should work more, this we know already. Yeah, we should. Uh, the, the, the EU Commission uh, has forgotten to, to see the social side of uh, the climate change. Uh, yeah, will the Commission do something in this field? Uh, can I also? <laughs> um, so the, I would indeed say that uh, in the uh, in the next legislative cycle, uh, it would be uh, and. We've heard this message uh, this morning also from Pascal Lamy, who, uh, who who made a very uh, intelligent statement about saying that um, the uh, EU cannot just push out climate policies uh, and uh, and try to increase ambition and leave it to the member states to uh, to then compensate all the uh, all the distributional effects. So there, um, I think there is a. Um, there's an intellectual discussion to be had, uh, a very interesting one in my view, about to which degree we try to, on the one hand, have the, the most efficient climate policies and leave it then to, uh, uh, to social policies to deal with the effects, or to which degree we try to essentially develop climate policies that take in, uh, distributional effects into account from the very beginning in the policy design. And I am arguing for the later. So I am saying that already in the design of climate policies, as they take center stage uh, uh, starting now uh, in, the, in the whole policy field, we need to take social considerations into account. Now, my, my pledge would be for the, for the next commission to take a really more integrated view of climate policy so that climate policies have will become or are about to become such a central pillar of European uh, policy making in so many fields, in trade, in fiscal discussions, in, um, um, yeah, in, in energy discussions, of course, uh, that uh, uh, in transport discussions, so all those, uh, those fields that are somehow interrelated but are currently siloed up in different parts, um, Climate is kind of the unifying factor and also can provide a value added of the new European Commission. So where really the new EU can show its value to its citizens and, uh, and beyond. And in that sense, social policy would be, would be then one element of, uh, uh, of, uh, of these five, six, seven different pillars that, uh, that, we, uh, that we should take into account. So a more holistic policy making on the, on the side of the European Union, in my view, would be a kind of a visionary step to, to go forward. Yeah. I would agree that we have to deviate from business as usual, as we would say, as an economist, and it's going to cost However, the figures that uh, Georg was quoting, uh, an implicit cost of a thousand euros per ton of carbon, I think I would strongly disagree with that. Uh, first, uh, that's very high. <laughs> also, if the market is working, when the prices are going higher, then all forces in society come into play so as to prevent the higher prices from coming. So that's the dynamic of technological change. And that is exactly what we also saw in Europe. After 25 years, we have a carbon market. When prices go through the roof, you know, you start economizing energy, you start looking at other options, etc. And so prices going scare high 
is going to be exactly the opposite. Once the prices are going so high, you get forces to bring the prices down. So I, I think we have to look dynamically at what we are doing here. Now, uh, what we learned so far is that time and graduality in your policy effort is very important. And you have to widen up to other policies. I would agree with Georg. There are so many other policies that need to be addressed. But let's also share out part of the job with the member states. Let's not go into the illusion that only the EU level is going to do the trick. I think uh, th th that's not the tune of the day. It's about cooperation between different levels. And I think so far, and that's what we elaborate in a book that I'm uh, uh, writing together with uh, Peter Viss, that is going to be uh, on the market in a couple of months, is that if you have good cooperation with different levels and with different players, you can manage the costs and you can reduce your emissions. And, uh, and, and I think that's a, a, a fairly uh, hopeful argument uh, in, uh, in also uh, in sharing our experience. After all, we almost decoupled in not more than uh, two decades our emissions with 25%. And we were not hitting the economic growth uh, as people in their normal econometric models would have anticipated at the beginning of the journey. If I may make one comment to, to Georg, that we were giving too many allowances to our companies but that is also an element of the gilet jaune. It's not a question of financial compensation, but it's also, also maintaining the levels of employment. Because if you compensate and you let your jobs go to the other side in the world, then you will have a gilet jaune reaction that is much more violent than the one that we see today. So uh, you have compensation, you know, the distributive effect, but you have also the prevention of creating unemployment. And unemployment means that, that you have to have uh, uh, a dynamic economic growth, a low carbon jobs, then technology development that are not cutting down the employment levels in Europe. So the gilets jaunes is an income element, but it's also an employment element. And I think uh, on the ETS side of things, we got things fairly right in not cutting the, the jobs in our companies, but pushing them through the price, but also helping them do a bit of free allocation to go into ways of production that are lower carbon compared to what otherwise would have happened. Dolph, any idea if uh, innovation waves to come can mitigate, compensate for two days foreseen distributional effects? Um. I, I would agree that long term, a thousand dollars or a thousand euros per ton of CO2 is, is a, a fairly high number. Uh, in, in practice, we have already seen that uh, the cost of a lot of these technologies, be it renewables technologies or be it storage technologies or be it EVs, have come down very significantly. In fact, much more significantly than, than what was anticipated. So uh, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, no reason to assume that uh, this would suddenly stop. But it's, it's what I mentioned uh, uh, in, 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 in my opening remarks, that there are a number of sectors which so far uh, have not received the same level of attention. So uh, th there is uh, more of an r and effort needed to bring down these costs. I should also say that uh, in order to contain the cost, we have to do everything right, and that is a little bit worrying. So it's, it's not only, it, it, it only about uh, introducing new technologies, but it's to have uh, uh, then, then immediately also that systemic innovation. It's not only about renewables, but also a major effort on, on energy efficiency and structural change. Uh, it, it's also then uh, uh, the question of, of, okay, how do you now deal with the incumbents in this, in this energy transition? And, and the issue of, of how do you retrain uh, all, all the people that will need new jobs? That is also a significant cost component. We, we discussed that this morning. And, and, and usually all of that is, uh, especially the last one, is not accounted for in, 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 in a lot of these cost estimates. So, I'm trying to tweet like, uh, like uh, 
sharing. Uh, <laughs> you, you want to work more. You want to work more. Please, please Georg, do. Um, just two quick uh, reactions to uh, to Joss on the um, uh, on the ETS and its uh, distributional effects. Now, I, I fully agree with you. There, there is good reasons to, to have those policies in place, and uh, on the uh, on the income side of the population, it might be uh, very uh, very sensible to uh, to introduce them. The only thing that I'm saying is. The, the policies ended up kind of shifting money from uh, uh, from consumers to uh, to companies, and that's uh, I think uh, that's a fact, and and we can observe that, and we uh, we have to consider it uh, one way or another. We have to understand what's going on, and uh, we have to justify it. Um, on the uh, on the thousand euros, yes, it's a provocative statement. It's uh, it's taken from uh, from a YASA uh, survey of uh, of different uh, decarbonization models. Um, those models very often take learning effects into account to some degree, but probably not the uh, disruptive things that uh, that we all hope for. On the other hand, they also might err on the uh, on the low end because they assume optimal policy. And what we have seen so far in uh, in uh, in most policy making is it's very difficult to uh, to kind of get political acceptance for for optimal policy. So I'm not going to to defend this uh, this number. It was just kind of to to point you out how much of an uphill battle decarbonization is, uh, 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 is, is going to be and continue to be, and that significant distributional effects are going to be expected, and I think you don't dispute that. I wish you good luck with political acceptance eh? of any policy, but it's not my job. Uh, other question? Thomas. Ah, Laurent. Thomas um, first, and then we detect Laurent on board also. <laughs> um, hello, uh, my name is Thomas Pellerin Carlin. I work for the Jacques Delon Institute uh, together with Pascal. And I want to come back on the social issue uh, because it has been uh, on the radar of several people for at least 10 years now, even e economists, academic economists, um, just quoting Stephen Kalbeck, for instance, who has done his PhD thesis 10 years ago on that precisely. Uh, so it's good that now it's on the policy debate in, um, uh, in Brussels, and it is today to some extent because of the um, active involvement of some actors that are in power today, including Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, who has a strong, uh, let's say, social dimension within his own uh, political priorities. I mean, he's the one, the reason why we have the European Pillar of Social Rights, for instance. Uh, but we don't know whether this will continue, whether this political a uh, push from the Commission on uh, the social dimension on all areas, including on energy, will continue when Juncker leaves office, um, whoever comes uh, oh. later on. Well, what is going to happen also with the next Commissioner or slash Vice President for energy, that also we don't know. Uh, but we today in this room, we can play a small part into trying to put this issue on the agenda of uh, the, the, the next Commission. Uh, to give two precise um, uh, examples, um, as Georg rightly pointed out, uh, the redistributional effect is not the same depending on where you increase taxes. Um, and it's a bit amazed, I mean, I'm a bit amazed by the fact that um, being myself quite wealthy, when I go to work, uh, for instance, in Berlin, I use the plane. And when I travel from Paris to Berlin with the plane, uh, the energy I'm using is being taxed at 0%. And my VAT on my plane ticket is 10%. When well, my sister, who is a waitress, uh, so she earns minimum wage in France, goes to work, the energy she uses to go to work is either taxed at 50% if she uses the electricity, for instance with the metro system, or at 80% if she uses a car. And the VAT, for instance, on any train ticket is 20%. So for how long do we think we can continue uh, on that? And here the EU definitely has a key role uh, to play, obviously working with the member states, but nobody is arguing for Brussels deciding on its own, uh, but uh, the EU can play a role in that. What will the next commission do? Uh, and the second and last element will be about who benefits from the energy transition. Um, if we remain in an energy transition where we put forward very uh, so-called smart technologies that are being acquired by the wealthy, it's not exactly the same kind of political support that if managed to make sure that the first political priority will be that no one suffers from cold in the winter. That's very simple. We have all the technologies in the world to do that. Uh, Energie Sprong, for instance, which is a, um, a research project financed by the EU in the Netherlands, now also in France, Germany, and the UK, is able to do uh, deep renovation of buildings to make sure that uh, the uh, heating bill goes from, let's say, 100 to 200 euros a month 
to six euros a month. That's a way to fight energy poverty, and that's a way to provide democratic political support to the transition. So Thomas made two points, uh, same taxes on different energies and no cold in winter. Laurent. And sorry, my background is engineer, so maybe I'm a bit uh, simplistic in my view of, of economy here. Uh, and I'm also a French citizen, so I'm getting worried with this gilet jaune and so on. And, and I feel being an engineer and knowing what technology can do, the real obstacle of, of this kind of transition is much more the so societal acceptance than the technology uh, uh, readiness, uh, to be honest. My simple question is when I see the debate in France, isn't, shouldn't we call this not anymore a tax, but an incentive to build uh, that transformation? And, and, and isn't there any need of being much more transparent on how this tax is actually flowing into the economy and allowing to build a wind turbine here, a solar PV there, or a, or, or a certain level of technology is, is, is currently, I think, the society does not accept that because they believe that this money goes into the uh, uh, empty pockets of the states and does not serve uh, the, the transition as such. So isn't there anything to do here? 90 seconds each. I would certainly agree that uh, the word tax is very unfortunate and we experienced that in the EU. In the 1990s, we had a carbon energy tax and we dropped it in favor of emissions trading, you know, which was one of the finding another word for something that is putting a price on carbon after all. Um, I would strongly agree with the comment on aviation uh, and the distortion of taxes. I, I think uh, we spent a lot of time. Uh, don't blame the commission for that. The only one to be blamed is ICAO and the awkward institutions that we created in a multilateral setting and that refuse all changes in view of the new challenges that are there. I stop there, otherwise uh, we can go into a long debate. Uh, but where the point I wanted to make on the redistribution is that the ETS at least succeeded in organizing redistribution and through that having a common European policy. If we would not have addressed the distribution issue inside the EGS, how would you think we got the Poles on board, or the Hungarians, or the Bulgarians, or the Romanians, who still have a lot of coal? So the redistribution element was the subject of the negotiations. And through that, we got in a situation where in the last uh, revision of the text, even the Poles were not voting against. They abstained because we found a way of accommodating their concerns for coal mining regions and needed to be implemented and added with social policy, the coal mining region uh, uh, element uh, that, that is there. The redistribution that we had was less of a social distribution, but a, a distribution between sectors. In fact, the ETS is a distribution that uh, taxes being paid by the power sector and is given for free to the manufacturing sector in order to protect the jobs uh, of our citizens in a world where not everybody is em 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 embracing already the carbon constraint that the Paris Agreement is, uh, is telling us. So the social effect was less because the ETS has after all a system for big companies and it is a system between big companies and the price on the product to the consumers is fairly limited, even if it concerns electricity, compared to where big energy users are, uh, such as uh, cement, uh, steel, uh, in particular, and chemicals, uh, just to, to mention a few. Um, yeah, three, uh, three comments to the, uh, to the two questions. Um, one, I see a structural challenge uh, with uh, efficient climate policies that is, it's very often efficient to incentivize capital owners because they have capital to do something, to invest somewhere, to build something, and you give positive incentives. So you give money to capital owners, um, um, which has implicit distributional consequences. At the same time, it's also efficient to, to penalize users, which also has distributional effects. So both very efficient policies, but in the end, there is an intrinsic structural reason for, for those policies to, uh, to be regressive. The second one uh, uh, to uh, to Laurent. Um, what what I also more and more understood is that there is um, um, kind of 
disconnection between the real distributional effects and the social acceptability. Actually, what we what we uh, what we see is that a lot of the uh, of the policies that have the the most significant distributional effects. Are, uh, uh, are quite politically uh, acceptable, like subsidies for individual technologies. And it's, uh, it's interesting, as an economist, I can only observe it's probably more for, for, for political scientists to, uh, to try to, to get their head around, uh, to, to see what we can learn from that and how that can help us to, to shape policies that are efficient. Um, but I think uh, at the end, uh, the distributional effects are going to hurt, and uh, and somehow they are going to hurt politically. E even so, in the short term, they might not. But m certainly, a, a different discussion. And then a last discussion on uh, uh, or last point on uh, on Brussels. Um, in the discussions in Brussels, uh, especially when discussing uh, ETS issues. Uh, you get a small group of people on the on the table that is very often the same group of people, and one group of people, uh, one very important group is essentially missing. And uh, Susanne mentioned that the uh, that the Consumers Association is now kind of investing more uh, in in energy people, and I think that's really crucial that consumers are taking place more in uh, in the discussions in Brussels because if only the energy intensive industry discusses with the green NGOs and the Commission about the solution, then the solution looks like the solution looks. Like and um, so we so we need to make sure that uh, that also the other parts of the uh, uh, of society take part. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. If you compare three numbers, the the um, the European uh, investment in renewables 2017 was about uh, 35 billion. Uh, the uh, European subsidy for renewables through uh, feed-in tariffs, etc., was about 60 billion. The European uh, R&D expenditure for renewables was about 1 billion. So if you look at these three numbers, you see that there is a problem if you really want innovation. Uh, there, there were good reasons to put the feed-in feed in feed tariff in place, etc., but uh, d d d this expenditure... Uh, this subsidy expenditure will go down in the coming decades. That will open up room for more uh, uh, investments in innovation. And maybe also some, some of the distributional effects can be, can be dealt with. So, so that, is, that, that is an opportunity. Uh, then, uh, of course, we have uh, a number of sectors where there has been limited progress because of the international competition. We have been discussing that for aviation, for shipping, for heavy industry, now for 30 years. Uh, we've always said we need uh, sectoral approaches. Uh, it has been tried a couple of times, it hasn't worked, but I don't see what else there is on the table. And I don't think we're going to uh, fund that emissions reduction through subsidies long term. So I would like to thank the panelists for the high quality of the discussion. It was really, really wonderful to, to, to have your views. Of course, we know that we do not know what the next commission will do, but, but nobody knows, huh? because the next commission does not exist. Or, or, how could we know? But we know that it will be an issue. Huh? We know that it will be a problem. We know that what we did successfully for, 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 for long, we cannot do exactly the same in the future, this we know. How will we do? We will see with the new commission. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer, Suzanne, for the book, Bruegel for the room, etc. And to offer to everybody a lunch, a, a light lunch. Thank you. Many thanks. You have been wonderful. Okay.